let's do the opening session, then I'll have some remarks, and we'll have the, the CEO remarks first uh, called to order. And can I get an approval of the agenda? And this would obviously be the uh, updated agenda. Second. Okay. Second. Nelson. Curtis, thank you. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest. Same as before. Same. Elena, the same as before. Okay. Um, and approval of the minutes, which I know are, are now in more condensed form. Than <laughs> <we've had. laughs> yes. Passed, although it, it's worth noting that there is at the very top of the minutes uh, a link to a video archive of the meeting. Yeah, uh, got a motion to approve the minutes. Mark, seconded by Charles. Any corrections or comments on this? More abridged version. Okay. All right. So just a, a, a couple of remarks to start the meeting up. Um, first, uh, <coughs> to, to welcome everyone and note that that I think that obviously a lot, there's been a lot happening over the last uh, couple of weeks. There's always seems to be a lot happening <laughs> on this project, and, and I think that uh, as a panel we should feel pretty good about the role that we play from an advisory perspective. Uh, I, in terms of some of the outcomes that we just saw, I think if you take a look at some of the outcomes on privacy-related issues, on intellectual property, on some of the jurisdictional questions, those are the kinds of things that as a panel that we focused on and talked quite a lot about. It came out in some of our reports, and I, I believe that it feels like some of that get, got reflected uh, in where things were at, and so uh, certainly the, it's a lot of work here, but I think the, the work is valued. I'd also note that uh, I was glad to see that in the letter from Waterfront Toronto, it notes that Waterfront Toronto will lead all privacy and digital governance matters related to the project, which is a, a consistent point that people have been raising as well. Now, all of this is to say, and panel members know, that there is no rest for the weary, as the, the recent events mean that there is, in many ways, more work, not less. Um, there is an ambitious schedule, and we will talk a bit about that in a moment, although it's worth noting, I think, that we actually had more time we have more time now than we had with the MIDIF, um, which was in, in an even tighter time frame. That, I'm told, we did in 57 days. Uh, this one, there is a, a longer period of time. That said, I think it's been recognized that people have raised concerns, both about the timing as well as a desire for a face, some face-to-face -face opportunities, which I think is important to ensure that we arrive um, at the kind of uh, consensus or at a, at the, a sort of report that we can all be happy with. Um, and so I had a conversation in light of, of some events that we'll talk, we'll hear from George in a moment about, um, but just before this meeting, we had a chance to talk about a, a slightly revised time frame, at least for the purposes of discussion. And Waterfront Toronto was agreeable to use the January 23rd meeting as a meeting where we would have the opportunity to conduct the face-to-face -face discussions that we were hoping for uh, on this report. Uh, doing something quickly in December, I think, is too challenging because there won't have been the time to have done the work that we want to have done, whereas doing it for January 23rd will allow for that. The delivery, given the tight timelines, will be in early February. That means for, that, that, that will require, of course, a fairly quick turnaround if we're agreeable to this from the 23rd meeting, but it, hopefully it accommodates both the, I think, really legitimate, well, well received concerns about you've got to have some kind of face to face. This can't just be done through email or a conference call, uh, and we need to try to build in a bit more time. So the, as a starting point for discussion, uh, we're looking at a Jan the January 23rd meeting as a meeting where there's an opportunity for that face-to-face -face discussion, delivery of um, our report coming in early February. Uh, note that, of course, we're not just involved in Keyside. There's also the digital principles and intelligent community guidelines, which also are referenced in some of these materials. We'll have the chance to talk a bit about that. Uh, so things are going to be very active. Uh, finally, uh, I'm really I'm glad to welcome George to the meeting. Um, you know, I, I think that you know the it, it's important. I think for the purposes of people putting in this time to know that it, that they're being heard. I think that was reflected in in some of the outcomes, but it's also, of course, reflected when we have executives uh, attend and participate our meetings. So thank you for for your presence today. And uh, with that, I'm happy to hand it over to you. For some well, thank you, Michael, and uh, I want to acknowledge right off the bat uh, and thank uh, the whole panel 
for uh, the advancement on, on the digital um, elements that we have to look at and we're progressing on. I have to say, both the public consultation, but in particular your report and the discussions at this panel help drive a lot of the discussion and, and the advancement. And I have to say, that advancement, I'm going to look to some of my staff at the end of the table. We've done a great job, and I want to acknowledge uh, the team. Uh, but also, uh, Sidewalk, uh, I think it's done a great job in, in recognizing where we need to go. Um, and that is, I'm going to touch on a bit of this in the threshold uh, discussion. But, you know, there was a lot more work that uh, has been advanced that didn't even show up in the threshold document. We couldn't put it all in the document. Um, but I think what we recognize is there is a lot more work to, uh, to be done. And uh, as Michael, you said, you know, we're happy to, to extend the 23rd as a, uh, another meeting, a uh, physical meeting, face to face, so that you have a little more time. And we've extended that deadline. Um, and, and I'll touch a bit on the deadline as I go through the entire process of what, what's really being expected of all of us over the next little while. So as you're aware, um, on October 31st, uh, Waterfront Toronto's board approved the resolution of the threshold issues uh, between Sidewalk Labs and Waterfront Toronto, and has directed management to proceed to evaluate the proposal as amended uh, by these measures. So I just want to make it clear that um, this does not mean the MIDP is approved, uh, that it's not the case. It just means the project itself is going forward. Uh, and it means the uh, MIDP will be reviewed uh, as adjusted and, and you know, part of this will be the appendix uh, that we'll be looking forward to seeing and we'll get a bit of a presentation from Sidewalk today. So again, you know, we've passed the first threshold, um, but we don't have an agreement. People keep referencing, well, does this mean you have an agreement? The answer is no, not yet. Um, uh, we have to wait to see what the approvals will be, uh, what advancement on the issues are and uh, we will see whether this project goes forward or not. So the, the key point is we have aligned on the key issues that Steve Diamond had identified in, their, uh, in his memo uh, to Sidewalk back in June. Um, maybe if I can just take a few minutes uh, with your permission, Michael, to just touch on some of the highlights of the, of the memo, and I think everybody got it in their packages. So I'll touch again, one of the, uh, probably, um, as you're aware, the scope of the proposal itself was a significant issue. Um, in fairness to Sidewalk Labs, as uh, our chair identified last week, at the outset, they uh, did indicate a desire to expand beyond the initial scope by Keyside. So the basic threshold issue uh, has now been resolved, and the project is clearly defined in the initial phase as being a 12, uh, on the 12 acres at Keyside only and the whole concept of the IDEA district has been removed. Um, in the area of digital governance, which of course is you know, the primary area that uh, we've asked you along with the IP uh, to look at, there is clarity that Sidewalk Labs will adhere to uh, both the current and future legislative and regulatory requirements. They will not precondition the project uh, on any exemptions or modifications of these of requirements. The Urban Data Trust proposal has been removed and there will be no more reference to the term urban data. Uh, both parties are committed to ethically and responsible innovation that reflects public values and enhances the public good. And to Waterfront's uh, Toronto's digital principles and the emerging uh, intelligent community guidelines, which are critical pieces of work that still has to be completed and, and clearly we're relying on your input to help us with that. And those guidelines are critical in, in terms of this project going forward. And as you said, not just for a key side, uh, it applies across uh, the entire community. Um, in the same way that Waterfront Toronto in the past pioneered higher environmental standards for development uh, on the waterfront, we're working with the government <coughs> partners to set appropriate high standards for privacy protections and other measures now contemplated for key side and throughout the entire waterfront. Uh, for example, we have acknowledged that the digital proposals may also need to go through a government approval process. And our ob objective is to require the control and collection of data in the project for any proponent uh, to go through uh, and be democratically accountable. Uh, the intellectual property, Sidewalk Labs, 
will expand, uh, as noted in our letter. Uh, it's patent pledge from Canadian only to global. And what that means is Canadian innovators will have the right to use Sidewalk Labs, Canadian informed patents covering hardware and software digital innovations. We've also shifted our uh, from uh, shifted our revenue share from being uh, based on profit to net revenues. Uh, the details on the commercial terms will be negotiated <coughs> as part of the implementation agreements uh, should the project proceed uh, after the evaluation. Um, the issue of the public administrator, which again was another hot topic, um, the proposal for the new public administrator, including WTMA, the Open uh, Alliance, and the Urban Data Trust, which would require new regulation and replace the existing system, has been removed entirely for consideration. Um, additionally, other matters that we did look at, vertical development, transit, land value, were also aligned through that process. So I won't elaborate. It's in the letter itself. If you have questions, I'm happy to touch on that. Um, maybe I think there's one slide that I want to touch on, um, if we could, and just walk you through kind of some of the timelines of the process, if you indulge me for a minute. So here are some of the kind of key milestones that were uh, in the process of uh, either in or have passed or will be uh, addressing in the near future. So uh, October 31st was the first uh, deadline, that was the thresholds. We have alignment on that. Uh, it definitely dealt with the you know major issues of the scope, um, the framework around privacy, and I think has allowed us, as I noted earlier, um, to have the board direct us to move to the next phase, which is evaluation. So the evaluation phase is starting. It is um, really three three pieces here. There's the technical reviews that will be undertaken. We've had consultants uh, along the way with expertise in given areas reviewing uh, the proposals as they're now being more defined to the 12 acres. We'll continue to examine uh, what that really means in terms of what project could look like going forward. Um, there is commitment for public consultation. We have two pieces to this. Uh, the first piece would be in uh, mid-November. I believe our dates are the 19th in that uh, area. And that's going to be an opportunity to engage with the community, to walk them through what does that letter, uh, alignment letter of uh, October 31st actually mean? Um, and what would the process going forward mean? Uh, so that'll be more of a briefing to the community and engaging uh, in terms of what the next steps uh, look like and what their participation could look like going forward. Uh, there will be a second consultation after the evaluation, so we'll get a, a little bit of feedback on that. November briefing will have an evaluation that will be conducted over the coming months. And in January, we'll get some of the feedback uh, after we pull that together. Uh, so that evaluation, some of the recommendations will be brought forward and we'll get public input in January around some of that. Um, and then obviously the other two, uh, you know, we have two panels, uh, yours and, and our design panel, that also will continue to contribute um, to our evaluation so that uh, as we approach March 31st and have to make decisions on whether we go forward or not, we'll be able to show progress hopefully on the key issues um, that will get us to the point where if, if everybody's comfortable and the board agrees and sidewalk agrees to go forward on March 31st, we'll enter into the next phase, which would be uh, getting into implementation agreements. And that means digging deep down in terms of what would the commercial agreements and other agreements look like and getting legal agreements. So, you know, there are opportunities for us to continue to um, really design this project and ensure that the concerns of the public, uh, the concerns of the panels will be incorporated into the decision that the board and sidewalk will eventually make uh, going forward. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I am going to raise an issue that somebody brought to my attention that um, there was some concern around uh, some media attention to uh, uh, an objection that was brought forward by uh, a couple individuals uh, uh, representing uh, or identifying some issues around First Nations consultation. Um, I just want to elaborate a bit on this, and I, I have a, a letter that I'm going to share with you uh, from the Mississauga and uh, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, uh, who wanted to clarify the position. So I will 
distribute that. I know it's not the scope of this panel, but since the issue was raised, I thought it'd be good <coughs> to touch on it, and I'll pass around uh, their their clarification. And they are uh, the first. Sorry, stage. Should, sorry to interrupt. Is there an ele electronic version that we can um, send out to the? We can. On the we could probably scan this. I, I got this physically from uh, Miss August, but we can we can definitely uh, scan it. Okay. And no, we, so we, have, we have a number of panel members online. Yeah, could we, uh, is there any way we can get that scan? Or it's they might have a copy. They might have scanned it already. Um, anyhow, the letter basically has identified uh, as the rightful treaty holders of the land of Keyside Project uh, as proposed, the Massachusetts of the Credit First Nation, uh, have been consulted by both Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs directly since the announcement of the project. And while we understand that no decision has yet been made regarding the project, we look forward to ongoing deep consultation in the future. I've had discussions with the chief directly. We have a relationship, um, even on the Portland's project, we, <coughs> the duty to consult has been delegated from the province down to us. We've involved them in that project. Um, they actually participate in uh, oversight of some of the, the dig itself and our archeological rights. Uh, we continue to have discussions with them. We have an MOU as his own letter or their letter identifies. Um, so we have an ongoing uh, commitment. We would also identify, we made it very clear to Sidewalk that um, it is not enough just to engage uh, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and urban indigenous communities, so it's not just the treaty, treaty rights holders, um, but they have to go past their legal obligations and have uh, a meaningful um, uh, engagement with those parties. So we've had, and this is a priority for Waterfront Toronto as well, it's not just a requirement uh, for sidewalks, so we've engaged and will continue uh, to engage. So I just want to assure you that uh, we're not only meeting our requirements, but uh, I think we have a good relationship with other parties and if there continues to be any concerns, we'll engage those uh, concerns with you. And it is a uh, requirement in the October 31st letter, so we've reinforced it as well. And I think um, the only thing I would uh, mention is uh, this morning, you know, we became aware, we were hoping that we might have a physical copy uh, of the appendix, and unfortunately we won't have the physical, but Jesse and the group will be presenting the overview uh, and walking through the document. The document itself will come next week, uh, so that commitment will be shared. They will get that out to you directly, but that's also one of the reasons we're comfortable in providing additional time uh, in the process and moving our dates back. Uh, but uh, the team from the sidewalk, I believe, will walk you through the content of that document, uh, but the fiscal document will be sent to you directly next week. I think that's it. Christine, anything else uh, I should touch on? Questions. Just a, a couple of questions. I, I think in the, uh, the resolution letter, um, there was mention of um, working groups to replace the uh, previously proposed governance mechanisms. So I'm just wondering if you'd elaborate a bit on what the thinking is around that. Because clearly, if there is going to be these levels of innovation, there is going to be a need to coordinate across governments and waterfront um, that, that work. Yeah, so uh, I'll let Christina maybe touch on this, but uh, clearly, you know, um, governments are looking at this issue as well, so we want to work with them, and, and we have uh, committees to have that conversation. We'll integrate, obviously, the governance issues into the uh, discussions at this table. But we also have experts in the evaluation piece. We have experts uh, providing advice to us. But Christina, do you want to talk about the rest? I, I was less on the um, on the evaluation process than the than the implementation process because the <clears throat> there was all of these proposed new special purpose bodies that were have now been wiped out. Yeah, um, that doesn't wipe out the need to in fact. Uh, so, so I can tell you what manage in those areas. Yes. I'm wondering what the thinking is on that. So I can uh, I'll touch on this, and I don't know if Meg's here, but. Um, the one thing that we have committed to, and I've done this before, is we are going to try to put together um, these task groups, which will have multi multi uh, levels of government on it to deal with specific issues. So as the proposal gets better defined and there are regulatory 
or the uh, or legislative responsibilities to uh, analyze and provide uh, permits and approvals. Uh, the intent would be to try to align to uh, to look at those issues collectively. And uh, I helped coordinate some of this on other projects uh, at the provincial level. So what we've committed is we would establish those types of review bodies uh, to try to uh, move those issues along. Okay. There's too early to sort of lay out a set of bodies at this point. It's, it sounds like it's just yeah. It's a as, as, as the project is better defined, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, then we'll look at what are the requirements that they need in terms of approvals, and uh, we will. So you know, we're not um, reducing any requirements. What we are trying to do is align and try to move up the right and, and just a second question. I, I'm not clear on the. There's also a, a clear commitment to create and work on an innovation plan, and I see it up on your on your chart there. I, I'm not quite clear on what the timing of that is. Is that something that is available for March 31st? Is it something that gets developed subsequent to March 31st? What What's the, the view of that? Well, I'll let Meg speak to this, but um, much of that is going to be developed as we go along now, because it is a bit of replacing the MIDP and getting to what is it that we're actually proposing for the 12 acres and what are the governance and other issues uh, that are uh, related to that new scope. But, Meg, do you want to? Yeah, it just um, refining um, really volume two, the innovations, um, refining that down to a list of um, things, initiatives, innovations that we want to pursue um, that uh, achieve the objectives that we set out for the RFP and uh, make sense with the smaller scale that we're working with now. Um, so that list is going to evolve, and yes, it will be ready for the March 31st um, for the board. Okay, so that's an actual document that would be approved, uh, yes, essentially, yeah. to go forward in the next yeah. stage. Okay. Yeah, that'll be the scoping. And, and as Meg said, really, uh, their first volume was really about their plan, and that had a lot to deal with the scope of the property, etc. That's been addressed. Um, governance, we've taken responsibility, so that third volume was kind of addressed. Uh, the real focus now is volume two. Okay. Just a point of clarification on that one. Um, will the innovation plan deal with the application layer, so like what we're going to actually be able to do with the technology, or will it actually look at the architecture? So like how will data move around, how is it governed, who owns the source code at that layer? I'm going to look at Christina. Yeah, Christina. So I think the focus will be mostly on the application layer because part of it is that we have to, pay to know who the partners are going to be around the table to deliver those services. Um, I think the architecture committee actually through this process and the guidelines piece will be able to articulate the required architecture for those services in that document that will be emerging as well. So there will be complementary documents, but the focus for the innovation plan would be more on the sort of tangible interactions with the urban environment, whereas I think the architecture committee, and that's part of what I wanted to speak about when we get later on the agenda, needs to start driving that conversation around architecture. Um, thank you. Uh, I think the uh, role that Waterfront played in pushing back on the MIDP and scaling it down to what it was supposed to have been from the beginning um, is a really uh, important um, achievement in a way, although it doesn't actually get us any further than where we were um, in the last year. Um, but I have two questions, I guess. One is about the status of the uh, decision that you're going to make in, in March um, 31st, and the other is about the role that DSAP, or what you're looking to DSAP for in playing uh, in uh, this rest of 2020. And I guess um, my concern is that um, it appears that you're going to be um, approving a plan in the absence of a governance framework, a digital governance, governance framework. Um, and to me, that's putting the sort of cart before the horse that um, and this is being discussed a lot, and I understand that you're, there's, a, there's a moving train here, and it's not so easy to you know, redirect or to put things back in the right order. Um, but um, I'm wondering whether the decision on March 31st will be one that's contingent on a satisfactory digital governance framework um, and of course, that affects us when we are evaluating the DIA. I mean, 
we're, we're, we're a, a little bit at sea here, or I feel that, in terms of, of what are we evaluating against since there isn't that, that framework. Yeah. Um, and then the other is, um, what is the role that DSAP is going to play in developing such a framework? <clears throat> and I think many of us on the panel were, when we came on board, were looking forward to contributing to uh, helping uh, Waterfront Toronto develop the capacity, the expertise, you know, the, the, the principles and the frameworks for such uh, a digital governance uh, framework. And so um, that I think is going to be our main work. Um, but I wonder if you can clarify uh, on both those, yeah. those fronts. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you're right. I mean, there's two parallel things that we'll be working together on, um, and the guidelines are quite critical to us, and, and Christina can elaborate, but um, when I came aboard, one of the key issues I had was whatever we bring forward with, you know, obviously input, and, and I am um, depending on that interest on the guidelines continuing <laughs> on the panel, um, because that is a critical piece, but th th that's critical because the framework should uh, or guidelines should guide us uh, whether this project goes forward with sidewalk or not. It should be the guidance for the future in terms of this project. Um, and, and that's why you know we're really impressed that we need to do that. At the same time, we need to, and we, you know, Jesse and the group will talk a bit about what they're proposing. We have to have that context. We're not making that decision right away. But both those pieces will be moving, and uh, you know, we, you know, ideally, if we had um, an indefinite amount of time, that's not practical. I think there's been lots of discussion for some time now. We're going to have to make some tough decisions, but we are going to count on your guidance on that uh, guidelines document. That will be a priority over the coming weeks. Uh, we'll be sharing the draft. Um, do you want to talk to this? So I think um, we just actually advanced the slide one just to give a bit more framing in terms of DSAP's role and also where the guidelines um, are, are kind of falling. So through the process of the discussions that we've had on the threshold issues, the public consultation process, work with external legal, there is a preliminary or interim set of guidelines that we are going to be surfacing in the next few weeks. Uh, we need to work with our government partners to be able to make sure that they've had an opportunity to comment. Those will then be subject to further public consultation. So these really are intended to address some of the concerns that we've heard through the public consultation process. Uh, and they will also go through what we would refer to as a bit of an industry market sounding. So ensuring that the, the criteria that are in those guidelines are actually meeting the, the needs and abilities for small, medium, and large companies, essentially, to be able to participate in this sort of test bed environment here in the waterfront. So the intent will be to surface those interim guidelines prior to the end of November and begin that market sounding process, bring them part as our uh, public consultation process in January as well. By March the 31st, we'll have gone through that process again with industry, government, and the public, and land on version one of the guidelines. Now, in the interim, if there's anything that should come up in terms of pilot projects, those interim guidelines, which are founded all on the principles of Canadian law and regulatory environments, would exist. And then through the process of even working through the implementation agreements, we're fairly confident that additional issues and items of concern would be raised that perhaps those guidelines didn't capture in the first piece, and we'd have an opportunity to revise those. Those guidelines aren't meant to be fixed in one moment in time. Um, they would be updated on a continuous basis to ensure that they are providing the best of the solutions that we can to protect the public good from a digital governance piece. So it will not be that there's nothing in place, it's just that there is a process to unfold. Uh, and there's actually a fairly robust set of these guidelines that will be uh, sent through to you. And I, I am in the subsequent part of the agenda going to be asking that the architecture can uh, engage perhaps most actively on this particular part of the file with us. The only thing I would add is, and you know, there are different <laughs> stages occurring here of details that will be shared. It is that December 21st, 2020, that is kind of our final kick at, are we comfortable that we have the proper governance structure and the details that align to that governance structure? So not all of that is gonna be completed by March 31st, but the key um, uh, observations <coughs> going will be shared at that time. Just want to build, build this, it's, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
I was just going to say we're going to discuss guidelines later, and I have more questions about sure. that. I, my, my question is about the sort of the status of the March 31st decision, which um, I would hope is considered only provisional, um, based on the uh, developing a, a robust framework. Guidelines doesn't sound like robust. I mean, guidelines are guidelines. I think it's important that there be that the commitments that are made before the project is approved be uh, legally um, uh, enforceable um, and and not postponed to the implementation agreements. So I, I'll, I can elaborate on that at later uh, in, the, in the agenda. But. I actually, we, we, I was going to say, we do have external legal here who might want to comment on it based on the process of where we're at and the enforceability of some of the pieces, considering we're nesting all of this within law. And also the fact that, you know, we do recognize that all three levels of government are going through a bit of a regulatory reform and modernization process. So some of this burden is not simply on Waterfront Toronto sure. in terms yeah, of the things absolutely. that need to be resolved. But Chantel, did you want to, to speak to this at all? Um, I was thinking exactly what you just said. Christina, this is a process and uh, that matter will be central and naturally every single player will do exactly the exercise that we have already done where we have put to sidewalk labs the thresholds or in fact the deal breakers as you will recall Christina was the word we chose with them and therefore there will be a continuum of uh, achievement towards the uh, modalities that uh, Canada is ready to accept or not. George, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and again, I think it's uh, primarily echoing your thought that the threshold letter is somewhat of the ice above the waterline, and then there's been a lot of work and discussion and thought below the waterline reflecting a lot of the sentiment coming out of this panel, for sure. And um, I think by the end of November, there'll be a fairly advanced sense of the guidelines. So Andrew, I think you're gonna really start to see um, the rubber meeting the road in terms of uh, where that's heading. Well, uh, sorry, Curtis and then yeah. uh, I, I just wanna, um, I guess try to characterize where I think we are in the process and, and build on something Andrew said to really like shine a spotlight on I think what we're all kind of feeling. So I think up until this point in the process, and I don't want to speak for all the DSAT members, but I think we have felt to some degree like our role was to critique, right? So we would get a proposal, Sidewalk would come in and present, and then we would react to that proposal, right? And I think what happened on October 31st was Waterfront said oh, there's 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 certain things where Waterfront is actually going to assert contr control, responsibility, ownership over those things. Yeah. And I think what flows from that is that the the role of DSAP is different. Like our, our role is now to advise on how to turn principles into substantive evaluation frameworks, right? D digital digital governance evaluation frameworks, which I often would call architecture, but I think we have we actually often mean the same things when we, when we say that. Um, so there's like a specific, so I guess in there is a question, is that true? Has DSAP's role become more of a sort of advise on the creation of those digital governance frameworks as opposed to a critique from of, of vendor proposals, advise waterfront versus critique vendor proposals. But I'll, I'll draw our attention to a specific um, paragraph in the, in the letter on page four, it says, Sawbuck Labs will lead implementation of advanced infrastructure systems in accordance with the innovation plan, subject to waterfronts review and approval. Advanced infrastructure includes thermal grid, thematic waste systems, and other non-traditional systems as proposed in the YDP. So it strikes me that if the innovation plan is really focused on the application layer and isn't taking a view on architecture, which is really about the fundamental business model of, of the information, then if I was if I was sidewalk pro proposing advanced infrastructure systems, I would do it in a way where the, the underlying architecture was to, to my advantage because I'm not being told anything else, right? And so I think for me at least, like that's the piece that has nagged at me through this entire process and I feel is still, is still unanswered is like, what is that operating system or what is that, that digital layer that all this stuff's gonna be built on? Who owns it? How is it governed? Um, who has access to it? Um, 
And so I, I, I echo Andrew's concern that until that's defined, it's very hard for this group to objectively evaluate proposals that are incoming because because we have we all have personal opinions about what that letter should look like but we don't have waterfronts position saying this is this is how you should evaluate it well i, I would say and i'll let christina get into this in more uh, detail but uh, i do want input on both of those things uh, on the guidelines themselves because that is going to be uh, further defining how uh, government will lead the waterfront trial on behalf. Uh, and we haven't defined where where in government that data was set. Uh, there are things that we have to sort through and, and, and the rules moving forward. Uh, but I do want um, specific uh, comments on their innovation proposals as well. So I do want that critiquing um, because that's important for us to look at because the reason Waterfront's involved in this uh, in this whole project is our mandate is to innovate. Uh, it's not just to govern the rules of privacy and data, it's to actually get innovations <laughs> into the waterfront. So, you know, I want to better assess, and the innovation here is not necessarily, not necessarily one innovation. The innovation I think Sidewise bring forward is putting this all in one community. And how does that really, is that plausible? Uh, are there things we should be Concerned about? Uh, do we want to narrow? You know, they're going to have to narrow down. I think originally we had, I can't remember the number, but 240 different innovations. Uh, but that was originally uh, proposed around a large geography. Now it's going to be smaller. It's going to be narrower in scope, and we'll look forward. I look forward to hearing what they're actually going to bring forward in their appendix. But I think what I'm really saying is, I, I actually want your help on both of those issues. Um, and I don't think, you know, we're not going to benchmark uh, and make a final decision on the uh without having context to some of the governance. Uh, but at the same time, those two issues are moving together. I don't know, Christine. I was actually just going to say, you know, Curtis, I think that's why actually I'm hoping the architecture committee is the one that will pick up the ball on the guidelines, is the guidelines are really going to set the conditions for that underlying architecture and how any services that will fit on top of that will interact with that architecture. So this is, you know, we've got a good core piece of guidelines that we can surface early and start to get that comment, but that group working diligently on that will set the proper condition. So that it's, now is the time to start rolling up our sleeves and really getting into that space. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can count on that group to really come forward. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm probably gonna restate a little bit of what Andrew and mm -hmm. Curtis has already said, but maybe in a slightly different context. I guess for me, it's it, it, it's, it's pulling on the thread of the role of DSAP in going forward. And it, it seems to me there's a blurred line between the critiquing of something that's presented to us to evaluate and what I'd consider creation of that content. And, and, I, and I look at it, uh, especially in light of what's happened with the threshold agreement and the pulling back of the data governance back into the realm of Waterfront Toronto. Um, and sort of the mention of the architecture committee, I mean, I'm a little concerned that the expectation of the architecture committee will be to create that architecture as opposed to evaluate somebody's framework. And, and I guess my question is with the short timeline, I mean, this is this is not a, you know, do over the weekend and create a framework for evaluation. That's what I was Yes, there's, was it? Okay. Okay, so Curtis is going to do that on this <laughs> summer weekend. This is it done. You know what? You've got a long weekend coming up. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. It's every day we can hurt to find. There's some holidays. But, but my, my, my point is, is, you know, how are we going to get that heavy lifting done? And how do we clearly define the role of DSAP in, the, in, that, in that governance piece and those that are pulling together that framework? Given that it seems like March 31st is a is a deadline in some regards, even for the data governance piece, even though it's been extracted from Sidewalk Labs uh, sort of portfolio. So I don't know if we're going to get into that uh, because, and, and I'll, I'll end my uh, sort of my piece on, will it be clear what DSAP has to do from an evaluation perspective on evaluating the DI, the MIDP and the DIA for March 31st? Will that be clear? Because it seems like a lot has been extracted from yes. from the sidewalk labs or the MIT piece, and it's not clear to me now. I guess it's really where I There are some other. Just before you answer that, can I just make sure people online can hear? Because I just got a message. Someone could. 
Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. So there is further discussion on this later on in the agenda. Sure. And actually, Vance has uh, a directional document that he's been working through for the first working group meeting of the report writing committee or what gets constituted out of the report writing committee um, to begin to tease that out. It'll be very specific in terms of what the scope of the DSAP will be in terms of what needs to be assessed. And I think actually, Greg, if you can bring up the layer cake just in terms of of sort of scope and scale and who else is engaged, I think it's important that DSAP has visibility on that as well. Um, and, and, you know, the evaluation piece is on the sidewalk materials. The creation piece is on our waterfront Toronto guidelines. And there has been a lot of heavy lifting that's been done through this process um, with Chantel and George and Tim Banks all being engaged and coming through those. It's a matter of making sure that they are packaged and consumable because uh, they're quite detailed already. So when the, when, when the group would get together, we wouldn't be starting from a, a blank slate there would be a really good starting point for us to be in that conversation. Um, and hopefully we can have that conversation quickly uh, with that working group. So with regard to the evaluation, though, we did want to bring up an old document that we had done in the past. I think Greg's needing a moment there. So this is just a reminder of the structure that was put in place around the evaluation. And I'm just going to wander over here for a minute. So as George said, we have the two panels. We've got design review and the DSAP. And then all what we have up here are the pillar evaluation teams, which are Waterfront Toronto staff and subject matter experts from external to the organization that we've gone through uh, requests for proposals and secured the interns. The development plan evaluation and virtual plan evaluation, which again are waterfront internal staff, but with support of external um, teams. And, and Meg, feel free to pop in if I say anything more here. The evaluation committee, which is senior waterfront Toronto staff and external subject matter experts. And then this is overseen by our investment real estate and keyside committee. And then ultimately our board of directors with comment by governments and interaction as per our government protocol that's put in place for this project. The public and government consultation process, you'll see it's a little hard on here, but there's a key line that goes across. It informs all of this process that's in this pillar evaluation with the subject matter experts. Design review has sustainability buildings, public realm and mobility really interacting on an ongoing basis with the DRP. For DSAP, it's this digital and data governance piece. And the DIA is intended to be the core document that you will have to be responsible for evaluating for. And the rest of the MIDP is simply there as a reference document. So in the past, we've talked about the fact that there are a lot of other groups that are looking at a number of other issues that are in the MIDP. And I wanted to make sure that that was abundantly clear, that the DSAP doesn't have to evaluate everything for everyone in every part. There is a very specific scope and function for the DSAP. Um, so the DIA, when it's received, is intended to be a, a very comprehensive document that will replace the chapter in the MIDP and allow for you to have a sort of authoritative source at your fingertips for that. So you're not going to be responsible for all 1,500 pages of the MIDP. Charles, and then if Karen Lister was a follow -up. Uh, I'll save it for later. Just so you know, I'll, I'll, I've, I've sent out all these slides, so you should all <coughs> have it at this point. Uh, Kevin, you you picked up on a couple of questions I was going to ask, but uh, I think the difference from sort of pre-October 31st is the sense that agency is quite and more appropriately invested in Waterfront Toronto around developing the framework and the governance structure. And I think that does, to the points that I think all three of these gentlemen were making, uh, changes kind of our role a little bit about what we're doing. And I think we should probably unpack the difference between guidelines and framework that is being th thrown around because guidelines are a set of principles and guiding signposts. Framework implies process, implies who's participating, what's the process, and how are things decided. And I think, uh, and then there's the, <coughs> the difference between evaluation and proposal and creation. And so I think in terms of like trying to map out exactly what our role is and what's the scope of the work that we're going to be doing, we should be very crisp around where are we evaluating, where are we creating or proposing, or can we create and propose given what we have available. Uh, and then 
a little bit of where is the agency around the, the governance and, and what does the framework look like that it's not that what we're looking at is not just a set of principles and guidelines that there's more it's got to be deeper than that um, the second point is looking at those pillars I think it goes back to where we kind of talked about before was digital tends to be throughout all the pillars so I don't think we should necessarily just be uh, constrained to the box on the diagram there uh, that there will be, as we saw with the MIDIP, there was uh, digital implications all throughout the MIDIP, not just within the chapter. Uh, and secondly, I think given the delta of the difference in terms of the scope and the, the changed uh, environment post October 31st, I'm wondering, I, I don't think it's really up to us to go back to the MIDIP and sort of say, okay, what parts of the MIDIP now apply? Uh, given the change thing. I think we need some sort of exercise that maybe Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk do to produce something that gives us that to work from. So three quick responses to that. One, um, when it comes to the guidelines, I think we use that term a little bit too generously that it, there's a lot more to it in terms of both breadth and depth in the framework concept that you've articulated and the process and so on is actually encapsulated in there. So it's actually that well, so there's pieces on digital governance, there's pieces on intellectual property, there's the process and the approvals and how DSAP fits into that, how the city approvals process fits into that. That's all kind of encompassed in those guidelines components. So it's perhaps a bit too light of a term to actually refer to what we're actually talking about. So thank you for clarifying that. With regards to the intersection with all the other pillars, agree there's going to be moments where digital crosses into mobility and digital crosses into public realm. When we asked Sidewalk to do the DIA though, we asked them to make sure that, that was abundantly clear so you weren't having to go and do a lot of back and forth between the materials so you would have a one-stop kind of shop to be able to do your evaluation. Right. So I think you'll find that it's a robust and very comprehensive document that navigates the MIDP in a very different way than what you've seen prior to this with right. Sidewalk. Um, and then the third piece, if we're on the evaluation, as you know, we get into the evaluation piece with Vance, we'll make it very clear as to what is still on the table uh, for you to be considering based on the, the revised geography and the smaller project and things like that too. Um, you know, in terms of limiting the amount and volume of, of information that needs to be navigated through or the amount of questions that may have to be answered on those things. That's a bit of a state of flux and we're working through figuring out what new documentation might be required how to frame that, what documents are actually still on the table based on the smaller project geography and so on. So we'll make sure that's abundantly clear to the panel. Karen and then. Just to echo Charles' later comments, this has been a trend in how we're engaged in this project. We're told it's a one place we need to look for the digital layer, but when we see the bigger picture, we realize it's it's all encompassing and we need to have a bigger <coughs> picture approach to this. Um, so I mean, I guess time will tell next week when we receive that document, but I'm a little skeptical that this one document will, will help facilitate what we're hoping to do. Yeah, just um, we're sort of debating two documents we haven't seen, um, and 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 so I, you're just getting a lot of anxiety from that, um, and so I, I can be anxious too. But I, I mean, I'm willing to wait until I see the documents, and then I think uh, uh, we're almost a week early in terms of this meeting um, because we, we we don't have a digital appendix, we don't have a draft set of guidelines. We, I mean, the, you know what you're talking about. We don't know what you're talking about. Right. So let's, I mean, I think, Michael, we sort of almost do need a, some kind of a checkpoint once we actually have the documents yeah. as, as, to to as to whether yeah. there's, you know, whether we're in a position where we, we're comfortable with whatever evaluation process we're, we're embarking on. I, there's no way you're going to get comfort here today because we're talking about two documents we haven't seen. <coughs> I think that's fair. And, and that's not a criticism. I, it just that's just a reality of timing. I mean, you know, we meet every two months, and if the dates are fixed well in advance, and that's that's life. But let's 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 figure out some way to actually connect um, in a you know week or so when when we have something in front of us that that we can say okay we we know what the process should be going forward, or maybe the working group should look at that and, and engage with. Uh, with, with the panel as a whole to say, look, here's what we think the, the, the real process is going to be now that we've seen the documents. Well, do, do you have do you have a, a recommendation and we can discuss it as the approach? I mean, you, you just outlined two possibilities. <laughs> One, to try to see if we can't pull together everybody on a call. Alternatively, we could leave it to the working group to do uh, a first pass and 
then bring that back to the full group, let's say, in late November? I, 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 I'd prefer the latter because, uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, there'll be a more substantive project plan that can be developed and a process that can be developed for people's engagement once there's been a smaller group that has worked on that. I, I think that would be my suggestion. I'm seeing some heads not. So if, uh, just thinking out loud, if if that group were to meet um, sort of a week or so, have a call uh, a week or so after um, we actually get these documents and then with the hope of having something by the end of this month or the first week of December for the rest of the panel to chew on. And then we can have a call for the whole panel yep. to sort of uh, mm -hmm. connect. And, 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 and then I think we've got, it gives us another couple of months to actually do whatever the work is going to be, which, I mean, I understand Christmas is in there and all that, but it does give us a couple of months of working time. <coughs> is there anyone on the call that uh, has any comments? No, it's not. Enough. I do agree with Mark, though. I think that's a um, sensible approach. Just one question about this document. Um, <coughs> the, the development plan evaluation layer and the commercial plan evaluation, um, the external vendors that are listed there that would be helping with that, how, I don't know how to ask this question without sounding skeptical, but like, how um, experienced are those groups going to be at evaluating the fundamental sort of information economy considerations that go into this? Because this isn't just the development of 12 acres. There's a whole innovation piece to it too. And yeah, is that, the right, is that the right set of vendors, I guess? Meg, do you want to speak to us? Um, so uh, what's not showing on here is the iteration that happens between the layers. Um, this isn't a one-time um, evaluation in isolation for each layer. Um, it's, there's a lot of iteration between the groups, a lot of discussion between the groups. KPMG and NBLC have been on the project since inception, are very familiar with all of the materials that have come. They do, KPMG in fact does have some expertise on the digital piece. Um, not the planning group, Gladkey is specifically looking at the development plan itself, but will be engaged in discussions across all of the layers. So I think that we're looking at the expertise of others on the on the SME side of things, our consultants for that, but we're also looking to the panel for, um, for some of that and our external um, legal team uh, to help us through that. Can I ask a follow-up question of Egg? So just to build on what Curtis said, on the development plan evaluation process, for example, there's not really, I have a discussion a question for later, but it applies now. Like, what's the digital master planning strategy around this? Because there's a point where the technology meets the land and current plan of subdivision or secondary plan doesn't capture the kinds of digital infrastructure. We don't really have an entire process. Environmental assessment might pick up pieces of it. So okay, it, these are, like this, your wedding cake is sliced in a kind of traditional real estate development bit with some other things added <coughs> on, but I, I don't yet see it reflecting the nuance and the interplay <coughs> between the innovations, which is what makes this thing, that's why we're all here in the first place. So how is that getting sorted? I mean, it's a fair comment. It's based, <coughs> the development plan evaluation will be based on the precinct plan, the file of the OP, that sort of thing, um, as a physical structure. Um, I think that the um, integration between the um, folks on the innovation side and with the development team and that sort of constant working um, process that they're doing together and collaboratively is where that will come. The other thing I want to say is this is about the evaluation as to whether or not we want to continue on. It's not about the implementation yet and I think to your point the implementation of this project will be different than a standard zoning bylaw application and site plan and building permit. We know, for example, with the Tullwood, there's a very different process that will have to be undertaken. We know <coughs> that we want to have uh, public engagement and council looking at the digital <coughs> components, which they haven't done in the past, so we're adding that layer on. Um, and, you know, we, you know, we think that having council opine and um, having the public opine on some of those pieces where they haven't in the past, um, and adding that onto the development process will be uh, helpful to that integration. 
and any suggestions this panel has to improve on that would be helpful because nobody's done this before. So it would be good to have those sorts of inputs from you guys. Sure. Christine wanted to respond in that. So I just wanted to build on what I saying. There's actually another uh, work stream that's parallel to the, the guidelines. And I mentioned the guidelines also have a process element to it. And we've been talking to uh, a number of external experts as well as our government partners on what does that intersecting process look like around digital and physical. And it's something that doesn't exist today in our traditional approvals process. So I was thinking actually that that might be something that you might want to be engaged in, Pamela, and trying to sort through what that may be. And I, not in a position to talk too broadly about that right now, but I'd be happy to share that with you after. Yeah, there are so many things in this project, you know, just go back to the MIDP, but just the use of the term um, public space and open space, you know, different words mean different things to different people, and people based on expertise hear different things, and just, I think the more cross-pollination you can get <coughs> ears and eyes on this, the better, because there's a lot in here that warrants really deep interrogation. Yep. Great. I just wanted to broaden um, Curtis's thought. He talked about the information economy, and, and I think that's certainly one important aspect that we're focused on. But I mean, more broadly, there's an economic development piece of this. Um, and part of it's digital, part of it might be tall timber, part of it might be other kinds of devices that you know are may have software inside them, but they're primarily devices. So what, what I, I'm not sure I see there up is on an that board is, yep. is where the economic development. It's a, Mark, it's just to the right of center. And, and who's on that? Uh, we have internal it's, and then Steer Davies. Well, Steer Davies. And there are a company <coughs> in the UK that's done a fair amount in the Kings Cross area, and they actually have worked on a number of digital projects as well in the past. We've done lots in Toronto, too, with Metrolinx. But, but to be specific, like, is KPMG, for example, going to evaluate the externality value of the IP that will be developed coming out of here, or are they evaluating the economic model of the 12-acre development? And um, I think that's kind of where I'm yeah. And really like. Steer, between Steer and NBLC, we'll be looking more at the economic um, piece. Um, KPMG will look at the process. Um, they, they're the process advisor, but they'll also look at any infrastructure pieces. Um, on the digital, Christina, do you want to advise? I, I know that they've got somebody, but I think you're relying more on your other, the rest of the team. Correct. And we are actually having some conversations with additional externals at the present time for their inputs, not formally necessarily through the process at this moment, but to help us advise on things like IP, uh, in particular, and broadening that aspect. George, do you want to speak to that too a little bit? Yeah, but, and, and, some of you may be thinking you saw last week's letter and it addressed some issues but not others and therefore perhaps you're thinking some of those others are being downplayed. So we're very alive to a theme that, that this panel has been very alive to which is open interoperability, ability to participate in the ecosystem in a fair way and in a meaningful way. And so there are elements of the letter that address that for sure. The patent pledge is one of them. It's one slice or one lens on that ability to participate. Um, but we've all read Lessig. We know that code is law. So we totally get that leaving aside the physical architecture, which is at one end of that slide, that the digital architecture is absolutely critical to the business model that will you know, take place and, and sort of grow up in the district. But for instance, it's been very helpful to have a physical definition now. Uh, and I know that's not primarily this group's purview, but with that, with the appendix, Mark, that you mentioned, which will be very important to understand sidewalks, next level of granularity on solutions and so on, to start to get to that business model discussion, which then informs the guidelines. And one thing that Christina mentioned, which is super important, beyond this group, which we lean on fairly heavily, as you know, and as Michael mentioned, I think a lot of your, uh, not just conceptual thinking, but some of your words were, were in that letter last week. But we're thinking we will, not thinking, we're planning to take those draft guidelines and running them by a bunch of companies 
Canadian companies, typically smaller companies, to test whether the business model for the district is one that they would be interested in participating in, that they feel comfortable participating in. And, and that's a really important part of it as well. Maybe I want, I want to share a metaphor that I've been riffing on around the office for the last month or so. So, because I, I think um, something that Pamela just said sort of tweeted me this. In, in the physical city, we have no, we've developed norms over 100 years for what infrastructure should be public domain and what infrastructure should be private domain. So, for example, roads are public domain, sewers are public domain, uh, people's homes, condos, the office buildings, those are private domain. Um, those have turned into uh, planning regulatory regimes that we now use to evaluate building physical cities. So, for example, things like like access control. So how does a private condo intersect with the public road, right? We have regulations around what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, you know, and how, how those should interop. The digital domain, <coughs> for the most part, still in the private, exclusively in the private domain. Um, and part of why I got excited about getting involved with this project is because I thought there was an opportunity to def start to define um, public digital infrastructure. What's the analogy between roads and sewers in the, in the public digital infrastructure space? And things like access control, you know, between a driveway and a road, the, the analogy to that in the information world is a standard, right? Like a standard, an API, a way of, of talking together. And it, I think that's kind of the, the core of what I'm asking about in that development plan evaluation is I think there's, I agree there isn't like a ready-made vendor we can go and ask how would you evaluate this? Because those, those, we don't have a hundred years of history of how you how you evaluate that. But to me, that's that's the opportunity is to identify which of the infrastructure should be private, and we, we want it to be run and invested in by a private sector. Which should be public sector, and then what's the interop between those two? Um, I might even make it a bit larger. What's the because even with you know we have building codes, we know and we know who defines with who what the building codes are, who needs how you apply to them and how you conform to them and how they're enforced. And uh, the same thing with digital public digital infrastructure is there may be parts of the, the digital infrastructure that's built privately, but it's within a framework that's controlled by the public. And what is that? And who who is that? And those are things that we still need to define. But what's if, if I or again, Chris, exist, but What's, what's coalescing in the digital space, and it's very interesting, there was a, a conference just last week in Dublin, and the Irish Privacy Commissioner is very active on these issues, is, is you're seeing <coughs> privacy, competition law, consumer protection, and then what we would call sort of communications regulatory, in Canadian terms, the CRTC, that, that those four strands are now coming together because the, the irony of, not the irony, but the challenge in digital <coughs> regulation is that it's not anchored by a physical node like a building or a physical uh, you know, road per se. Um, and so we've got to come up with the regulatory structure with those four and maybe a couple of other elements. But, but as, as, as George has repeated, as you've heard from Christina, you know, Waterfront Toronto actually doesn't control any of those four in this jurisdiction. So the other governments are coming on board. They're, they're, they're looking at it hard. So we, we can be the catalyst to sort of drive that, and particularly with some technology concepts and ideas coming out of Sidewalk. We now, in the letter, though, have another very important data point, which is that, you know, private sector developers will be participating in some of that physical, but they're now very interested in that digital as well. So, so th this iterative process is happening, but to Andrew's point, it, it's not going to be a definitive guideline on November 30th that's, that's done. It's, it's going to take a while, but we're hoping there's enough there to build a decision calculus in March, and that if the project goes forward, that there's enough to reflect in a legal agreement by the end of next year. 
So lots to do, and, and a lot of it will be a little bit kind of version one might be different from version two. But again, we're totally alive to how those four elements are all playing a role. Okay, so I think we, we should add to the mix that in parallel to what are all of George is uh, saying, and I was on the panel with Helen Dixon in Dublin, ah. uh, is that the Canadian government is introducing a consultation on reform of the private sector privacy act as well as asking the competition bureau commissioner to work on an intersection between privacy law and competition law to assess issues of market dominance in relation to data accumulation and so on and so forth so all i want to say is that the convergence that george has just described is also the object of legislative reform in Canada. Therefore, our project could actually evolve at the same time as our regulatory, regulatory framework is evolving. Yeah, I mean, I think this discussion is very interesting because it shows the complexity and also the mm -hmm. promise. Um, but it takes time, and it's and to do it right is going to take a lot of time and effort on our part and a lot of other people's part. And my concern is, is that commitments to particular directions will be made prematurely before we have worked it out. Enough out. We, we can't work all of it out. And of course, part of the attraction of the of this as, as, a, as a test bed is that we can work, work it out. But we have to, I think, get some clear understandings in place before we proceed. And that is going to take more time than is shown in the schedule. So. Yeah, I just want to respond to George. I think those the evolution of that constellation of people thinking and doing is interesting. But what I would note is that there's an absence of anyone in those disciplines who has any training in spatial design at all. And so these technologies and these, these processes mean one thing in the abstract. <clears throat> they mean something entirely differently when they land in different kinds of communities with different kinds of groups of people. And so I think that the the progressive piece of this work involves bringing those two sets of disciplines of people together. And so it's planners and architects and landscape architects in addition to the lawyers and the privacy experts together. So that's, uh, that's why I know I'm broken record on this, but that's why you mentioned the process review. It shouldn't just be your traditional like development project management <laughs> process review. Is I think it's so key is how are we going to do this? So how are the technologies going to be developed? With who? By who? What's the process? How do you do a test bed? How do you fail? Because we need, because we are doing, we are in a spatial area. We were just talking over lunch over where, you know, things fail in the field and you need a way to sort of recover from that elegantly. And so we, I think that's such a key part of this and I don't think we're really addressing that in anything that I've seen. And we, I would like to see more of that. How are, what is the actual process by which we are going to do the work? So there is a staff work stream associated with that coming up in the next phase. And if there are DC members who are interested in being engaged in that process, I would just ask that you email me directly if there's specific members that have an interest in that intersection between the digital and the physical space. And we'll make sure that we figure out how best to loop you into that process, either as DSAP members formally or through your other professional capacities as well. Mike? Just a thought. Um, <coughs> maybe I shouldn't think out loud, but there might be an opportunity at some point for DSAP and DRP. Have a working session. Um, I was thinking the same thing. The That's a good idea. Yep. Okay, maybe I should think about it. <laughs> Once in a while. Sure. Um, yeah, all I was going to say is that um, you guys talk about this project being as a catalyst. That's absolutely correct. But in government, government agencies as well, their biggest power is the power to convene. You have the attention of a lot of international players, experts, and while I'm sure in the federal government, in the provincial government, in the city of Toronto, these conversations are happening internally. They're happening internally. They really need to come out of the woodwork and start talking to each other in a in a more integrated basis, not just as governments, but as just institutions. And there's an opportunity for Waterford Toronto to really help push that forward. Uh, I'm sure you guys are doing that. Sounds like it already, but. Um, the more you can do that in this period of time, the better, I think. All right, anyone else uh, online before we kind of close?
close this discussion. Okay, hearing none. Uh, so we've got at least a bit of a schedule in terms of dealing with the, the incoming documents. We've got a prospect of thinking about new kinds of collaboration. But still some stuff that's, I think, to be determined down the line. We ran a bit long with that discussion, but obviously it's quite <coughs> important. I think we can make up the time a little bit later on. I feel like we've dealt with some the agenda items. Okay. Anything in the management report? Uh, the management report essentially we've touched on everything that was in there. I just want to acknowledge the IPC letter as well that we received. And you know, I, I do want to just echo George's comment that between the, the DSAP report, the public consultation report, and the information and privacy commissioner's report uh, letter that we received, there was a lot of very good directional statements that allowed us to proceed through the threshold issues discussions with Sidewalk. Um, and they were all actually very well aligned in terms of a number of the themes that emerged through those three documents. So that was extraordinarily helpful. Uh, we've talked about the threshold issues resolution and guidelines we're going to cover off in item six. So I think we'll just take that as, as right and move forward. <coughs> next up is next phase of the consultation. Christina, I actually wonder, in the interest of time, I think both you and George have talked a bit about consultation. If there's a need to go over these few slides, I'm happy to do it, but um, maybe just touch again. I seem to have not included the slides. Oh, oh. Well, that makes it even easier. There you go. Are the slides in the pa package? No, they're in. Oh, are they? They're in the board. Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> you want to do just a mm -hmm. one, two minute, one minute, two minute yeah. overview? Or? Sure. Is there a Next steps on engagement? Slide, slides are in the board book, but they're just not. They're just not up here. Bulk package. Um, so in, I'll hold this up. <laughs> in your package, you'll see a familiar graphic that was presented to um, the DSAP panel earlier this spring by Nicole Sworn, our public engagement uh, facilitator that we hired to help us with this process. Um, it initially had contemplated two rounds of public consultation on the MIDP. There was the first round of consultation, which already took place in July. Um, you've heard lots of, about the outcomes from that first round of consultation. Um, the feedback that we heard at that time, really, as well as the feedback from DSAP, DRP, and from um, other sources, really helped to inform management's approach and, and the board's approach to um, the October, October 31st resolution to, to the issues. Um, we also took that as an opportunity um, to recognize that just like this group of people has had a lot of questions for management on, on what that realignment means what it is that Waterfront Toronto is considering going forward, we knew that the public would also need that moment. So we've um, intersect, uh, inserted on your next slide, same graphic with a little insertion. We've inserted this public briefing, um, which we've now scheduled for November 19th. Um, we're calling it a briefing, not a consultation, because we're going to take that moment to walk through all of this um, with the public and allow them an opportunity to ask us questions that they're clear on what it is we're considering in our evaluation going forward. The second round of consultation will then take place in early January once our team has had an opportunity to do some of the technical work and advance some of their evaluation. And one of the things we heard from the public is that they want to hear how our evaluation um, and analysis of the proposals aligns with our objectives. So we're going to come back to the public with some of that work in early January. Um, the slide you'll see says December and January for the second round of consultation. Our aim is to actually um, publish the discussion guide for that second round of consultation in mid to late December so that people have an opportunity to sit with some of the material before we actually um, host our public meetings. Um, so that's what the December, January is about. So the second round of consultation will involve multiple meetings. Uh, we'll probably have two to three different public meetings. We'll do a couple on weeknights, one probably on a Saturday, again, providing as much opportunity as we can for as many people to come out and participate in the conversation. There'll also be the online consultation again, um, and an opportunity for people to submit um, their comments to us in writing as well. And all of that uh, will be on the initial evaluation will help to inform how we complete that work and then management's ultimate recommendation to the board in March. Um, the last slide in that deck was just a screen grab of the City of Toronto's website um, to the 
point, a part of the conversation that you've been having here, the City of Toronto has announced that they're going to be starting their digital consultations in January. So we are coordinating with them to ensure that none of our dates overlap with one another, but also we're sharing with them um, everything that we've learned through our civic labs and through the public consultations to date so that they're not recovering some, some of the same ground with the public that, that we've already done. So built, making sure that everything builds. It's December. December. What did I say? I'm sorry. City's consultations start in December. So super quick, not to um, underemphasize the importance of public consultation, but uh, I, I think you've heard from George and Christine about it already. Any questions? Um, well, in terms of the, the actual public meeting process, what, um, what may you have learned from the first round and what might you do differently in the second round? In terms of the meetings? Yeah, in terms of the actual meeting process itself. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, they're by nature of what we're going to be talking about, they're so different. Um, you know, the first round of consultation, we came out very quickly after having published the MIDP and people felt like they really didn't have a whole lot of time with the content. Um, in order to, to come with a really informed opinion for us. Um, there were pros and cons to doing it that way. Um, our feeling was we needed people, we needed to help orient people to the content, um, orient them to the MIDP from our perspective as the, the steward of the public interest in this process. Um, with this round, the learning we've taken is we know that it's too quick to ask people to give us feedback on something right now, but we also know that people need the opportunity to understand more of what we're talking about. So that's why we've inserted this briefing and then push the second round of consultation out just a little bit so people have time to really um, understand what it is we're looking at and talking about. Have you thought about which, you know, how you're going to segment the, the conversation? That's another thing we heard loud and clear was people saying you can't have isolated conversations in different rooms about these things because to the point of part of the conversation you're having here is that the digital cuts across so much of it. So we'll, we'll structure that so that more of the conversations are happening all together. Just a point of clarification, what if our Toronto's consultation is about the MIDP moving forward, but Michael, the city, your conversations are about digital technology, the city writ large, and the principles, and the work that the city's doing, right? That's right. We're responding to city council's uh, direction to create a... Michael, can I get you just to stand up? Just the people on the phone, I want to make sure Sure. are here. Um, and I have my IT colleagues uh, here who are leading this process, but uh, I'll speak briefly and you can chip in if you want. Uh, so no, ours is uh, in response to city council's direction to develop a citywide uh, digital infrastructure and data governance policy uh, that will be used to evaluate proposals that come through this project, so that it's uh, not exclusive to this uh, project. And, uh, even if this project did not exist, we would still be doing that process. Thank you. Is there a coordination just in terms of um, making sure the public's not confused about if they're both going on at the same time around the same topic, that uh, they're not on the same dates and that confusion about what they're at and just if there's any coordination between yes that's a major concern uh, that we have and we've already had meetings to talk about that and that's a continuing source of discussion I think part of that is that um, at the waterfront Toronto meetings they will identify the fact that our process is happening and the relationship to it and similarly we'll talk about this one we know that people will be aware of both and that we need to explicitly talk about what we're each doing and to benefit from each other's work. Great, thank you. Can I just ask, for the, for the last round of consultation and we had the Civic Labs and we had a wide array of different events, I'm not sure if contact information was, was taken from people who participated in that or submitted something formally, but I guess I, my question would be one, was it, and if it was, did we, was there a follow-up that people were provided both with the report on the outcomes and even more the most recent set of developments so that they understood the extent to which what they had provided ultimately had an impact on the decision-making process? Yeah, so for the um, public consultation in the summertime, um, when people arrived at our events, we had a sign-in <coughs> sheet. And 
part of the purpose of that sign and she was um, so we could identify how many people might have been coming out to join us and look about the project but we did ask them if they were interested in two different things one was receiving um, the feedback summary directly from that round of consultation um, which we did do so after each meeting we produced a summary report the people who provided us with their contact information we shared the draft with them to make sure it was an accurate reflection of that conversation before we then published it publicly the second thing that, that we did was we asked if people wanted to sign up to the Waterfront Toronto newsletter list, which is our way of staying in constant contact with people um, as we um, announce new consultations or briefings or um, as we publish new information. If I can just add to that, one of the things we try to do, is, <coughs> Steve did this a bit in his remarks when he was responding to the alignment issues. Is, some of those issues were directly related to the letter he put out uh, to Sidewalk, but a couple of those issues actually came out of the public consultation. Land value was one of them. Uh, so we explicitly noted this came out actually through that process and we've addressed that issue so that people could see uh, we listened and we responded to some of those issues. I would just know, I mean, I, and I thought that there was a strong communications effort, obviously, yeah. at that moment. Uh, as someone who's participated or appeared a lot before committees, I think it takes a lot to get someone to show up in the evening to one of these events. Um, and thinking about something that is personally sent to each of those person, I mean, we just yeah. talked about emails, that personally sent so that they know that they have been heard uh, mm -hmm. beyond just sort of that public distribution, I think uh, <coughs> helps provide that kind of positive reinforcement that it is worthwhile participating in these consultations. Uh, the question I have is, through these consultations, are we reaching the groups uh, and the individuals we need to reach? Because it seems like this is very much done on a voluntary basis, and those that choose to engage, engage. How much effort are we putting into engaging those that maybe find themselves outside of the process? And I guess this is where I'm going with this. Are we, is this process suffering a little bit from its own data poverty? Are we, are we skewing the results of the consultation? We're not necessarily reaching all the groups that should have a voice. That, that's a really great question. And interestingly, we had a meeting with the United Way of Greater Toronto um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, actually, maybe it was September, time is passing so quickly. And they were asking how they might be able to help us reach some of those communities. So we're having a follow-up conversation um, with United Way to see how, how we might be able to reach those, um, those people. Um, I will say that uh, during the development of the MIDP, uh, there were a number of um, different working groups that were set up across each of the different pillars. And when those advisory working groups um, were convened, there was a lot of um, time and thought put into finding representation for those different constituencies within the community so for example on the um, affordable housing pillar I know that we reached out to or that's and that sidewalk reached out to a number of people who were affordable housing providers or um, advocacy groups that represent um, people uh, affected by uh, the housing issue so we've, we've made a lot of efforts to do that, both in the pre-MITP <coughs> consultations, we're trying to find new ways to reach people through the um, consultation to inform our evaluation, but that's a, something for us to think more about maybe. Well, I think it goes beyond reaching out, and it's like who's actually responded. Mm -hmm. So when we compile the results, like how many do we have actually contributing from those various groups, as opposed to just making the effort to connect. I think that's laudable mm -hmm. that we are. But we got to look at the feedback that we got and where it's coming from to do a proper evaluation. I think it's really important to know the spirit of transparency that there were three kinds of working groups: Sidewalk Labs ones, Sidewalk Toronto ones, and Waterfront Toronto ones. Yep. And not all of the working of those working groups was shared or public. And so, I wouldn't count those as part of a broader public engagement process by government to citizens or a government agency to citizens. I. They were useful in different ways, but I'm uncomfortable with equating them with the process moving forward because of the nature of the sharing and the public or not nature yeah. of the deliberation inside. Well, that's a, that's a good And there's point. also an advisory group that doesn't have a public membership still that's on the sidewalk side of things. So I think they're quite different. Yeah, yeah. different. Yeah. Um, I just wonder in, in developing uh, 
your thinking and approaches to public consultation, whether you've looked to other cities that are also making um, or digital city uh, initiatives. And, and I have in mind particularly Barcelona, which has had a very active um, program. It's somewhat different political context, but, but uh, they've engaged um, in substantive ways. Um, they count 40,000 people who are actually actively engaged in this over time. And they have, uh, the, Barcelona, I guess, is seen as as the leading example of a sort of citizen-focused or citizen-centric uh, approach to incorporating digital technologies in their city. Have you, have you looked at that or other cities? I mean, Amsterdam comes to mind as well. Uh, in terms of their public consultation? Yeah, how to do it. Um, I personally haven't. Um, mm -hmm. Sworn Facilitation has a lot of experience, certainly in consultation across Canada. I know that mm -hmm. they're not focused um, their work isn't focused just in Toronto. I think they've worked quite broadly across the country. In terms of consultation um, related to other smart city initiatives, um, <coughs> members of our team, Christine I know, has um, contributed greatly to the um, structure and how we execute on our consultation. She's quite familiar with what's been happening in some of those other locations as well. But we could look to that. I could look into it. I just want to add, um, we're sort of Matt, can you stand up? Sorry, sorry. just so people can. Hear. Um, just want to add that we we're we're having a consultation, but as you've heard from, and I hope the city's also having a consultation. And correct me if I'm wrong, Barcelona's is led by the municipality or by the right. city. Yep. Um, so I think if we can think about it as a combined effort, and we are working together, but the, that there are two processes kind of pulling everything together. But I do agree. <laughs> if there are things we can learn from those yeah. processes, we're definitely open to that discussion. So. If I may, uh, there is a critical difference, for example, between uh, Barcelona or Palo Alto, is that the whole project originated from the mayor. So that you see we had an elected official, it changes the dynamic completely in terms of citizen focus. I just wanted to put that yeah, on the table. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, different context. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the next item that we have on the agenda is fairly sub substantive to take a look at the digital principles, but our discussions run a bit long. Uh, I'm going to suggest that maybe we break 10 minutes earlier than we anticipated uh, so we come back refreshed to have that conversation. I think we can make up the time in the, uh, in the second half because some of, some of what's on the agenda are things that we effectively have in discussion. Is that good? Okay. Let's, uh, let's break for 15 minutes then. So we will pick up with uh, item six on uh, the digital principles and intelligent community guidelines. I have a quick <coughs> Sorry. So um, thank you everyone for turning your attention to this. Uh, it w what is interesting is over the course of the past few meetings, this has been on the agenda, but we've never quite had the opportunity to discuss the principles. And for some context, I just want to walk through uh, how we got into the development of these principles over a period of time. So the principles were actually informed by the civic labs that we had had through the summer as well. We brought them to the digital public consultation um, <clears throat> that we had had with the, the Toronto Public Library. So what you're seeing in your package is the result of those civic labs as well as the feedback we received at the public consultation process. Um, what I would say today is that you, the full document that had been circulated essentially has not just the principles, but the beginnings of what will be teased out for the full guidelines. There's the what were the principles and then the how you would achieve those. So they went both shallow and deep, but at the end of the day, the principles are really the five high level items that are in blue in your packages uh, that deal with things like everyone will have access to and benefit equally from digital solutions. Digital solutions will be open, ethical and resilient and so on. I won't read through all of them. Um, <clears throat> and really, those are the areas that we need to really focus on. Uh, I, I saw there was a lot of comments in the subtext that was in the, those documents, and those will help to inform the broader guidelines uh, process. So those five principles, again, the public had provided feedback on. We had an earlier version that weren't quite as accessible, that the public had a hard time really understanding what was meant there. Um, we are going to add just a paragraph of text 
underneath each of those that describe what the objectives are to having those principles in case people aren't as familiar with what the concepts are that are contained therein. But the how that you see in the sub bullets will be translated more <coughs> deeply into the, um, the guidelines. So really what we're recommending or looking for is that <coughs> the DSAB, now further to all of that consultation, <coughs> recommends that they're comfortable with these principles so that we can take this forward to our board for approval. And those will become our digital principles at Waterfront Toronto. The nice thing is they mirror a number of things that you see in the other digital strategies that are emerging from the province as well as internationally. <coughs> Questions on the principles? So it's just the five principles on the right hand side of that chart that you're really looking for? Correct. Sorry, what are we looking at here uh, for those on the phone? It's slide. It's in, it's um, number 12. Page, page 12. 70. Page 12, and it's page 70 of your book. Page 70. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark, though, it, it's five, but for instance, principle number two, um, open is a whole discussion. Ethical is another one. Resilient. Uh, I know this committee has talked at some length about resiliency and so on and so forth. So, so it's... No, I, I understand there's pages that can be written about each of those yeah. words. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I'm just trying to bring it up to what, what are we dealing with today and no. we're not debating the pages that are behind those words. It's just those, those, five, items, those five, five, five specific sets of words and not even the diagram on the left. It's really the five... Yeah. The, the, the diagram in the, on the left is actually the, the former names of the principles, and the diagram just hasn't been updated yet. Well, actually, it's important because the, the diagram on the left that has that, though, were the pillars, the underlying pillars that resulted in them. So I, I tend to show them side by side so people understand what's at the core of what's articulated in a more accessible language. But you're really looking for endorsement of the five Correct. on the right hand side of the page. So this is a, a question on principle three. Um, in terms of the principles being adhered to and the commitment that any uh, any initiative will adhere to those, is it realistic to think that everyone will be able to understand how their data is being collected and used kind of everywhere? Is that, I mean, it's a great principle, but in terms of trying to get, in, in terms of making sure something adheres to it, uh, will we be able to measure that everyone does understand how their data is being collected? So it's just, whether that's a realistic principle to actually have. That's fair. Like, I, I could see, and again, we don't have to talk about Christina, like, I, I, could, I could see that morphing into something like everyone will have the opportunity to understand. Um, again, just kind of, just kind of sit, like, you're right. Like, can we ensure that everyone does understand? Possibly not. But we can certainly say the, the information for everyone to be able to understand is, is the intent is there. In the yeah, case. exactly. The same with principle number one. Yeah. You know, everyone will have the opportunity to have access to and benefit right. equally from whether or not they choose to exercise that, the opportunity would be provided to them. So we could add those words, and I think that would provide yeah. a softening that is appropriate. <coughs> George, did you want to? Speak? Yeah, no, I was going to actually just mention number one because, uh, you know, to, to imply everybody will benefit equally, <coughs> you know, so pushing it, right? But it is the opportunity to access and, and participate and benefit. Okay. And, uh, Andrew and then Kevin. I'll put myself in those things. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, just before last week, I guess, uh, Vance circulated the earlier version of these um, dig draft digital principles for, for our comment, and Teresa and I provided extensive commentary on the full set. Um, and because um, you might not have seen it, I'd, I'd just like to read my overall comment and then relate it to, to this particular diagram. So um, there are many good details expressed in this set of principles, but I'm concerned that it is missing a clear indication of how they are to be applied in practice, and in particular, what force they will have. Accountability is appropriately included here as a principle, but it is not sufficiently elaborated of how it will be enacted. Statements of principle cannot be understood or endorsed in isolation from the wider regime of accountability in which they play an essential but partial 
supporting role. Even the best set of principles can have perverse effects if they're not embedded within a regime that gives them force. In the contested terrain, this particular set of digital principles are destined for, accountability enforcement cannot be treated as separate or not afterthought. A vital step in developing a suitable accountability regime is identifying the actors, their responsibilities, and powers. Teresa has begun this work below, and she has provided substantive comments um, and indications of where actors um, uh, are, are needed here. In light of this, I believe more work and discussion is needed on this statement before it is ready for DSET to, to vote. I did not recognize at this point that you're going to be asking us to just do these five, but I am <coughs> immediately struck by the fact that you're, on your lower right, you have um, a, a, a blob or circle said transparency, accountability, and responsibility, but they're not in the five principles here. And I think that is a critical lack, and I'm, I'm struck by having them lost in moving from the full three-page set to this, these five, five bullet points. So I think that is, is critical, and I'm really puzzled as to how something as fundamental as accountability <coughs> and transparency is left out of that. So, right. so, so please, please, please help me understand out. that. It's not left out, though, Andrew. It's meant to be woven into each of these, and well, that's an underlying piece to it. It and needs to be said. It's but, but I think that's three. what principle it's three important. is. That's why I have number three. three. It's it's Everyone three. will be able to understand and how organizations can be held accountable for their for their practices. I think that um, it does not fully do that in terms of the of making making, I think you need to show how those accountability, uh, how that accountability is going to be enacted. I think it needs to be within a framework where we can see how these principles are going to be deployed and what force um, they will have. At this point, I don't see that. Now, obviously, everything is partial here, but I'm just um, disappointed that that that, it, that that seems to be missing. So as I said in my opening remarks, the guidelines that come after this will fall into those broader categories that we see in terms of the, the sub-bullets. Transparency and accountability, if you look at the <coughs> slides that follow around the proposed structure of the guidelines, there is an entire section on transparency that would include the accountability provisions in the guidelines. So how that actually gets enacted there's a jurisdictional context that deals with regulatory and applicable legislation and so on. So those pieces will be very clear as these two documents come together. And Chantel has done a comprehensive environmental scan as well in terms of what is needed. And I'd like to actually ask you maybe to, to join us for this conversation too, Chantel. Um, yeah. Do you want me to comment now? <laughs> or? Sure, do you want go. me to comment now, Christina? Yep, go ahead. So first of all, uh, the first thing that I would like to bring up is that actually three of these bullet points actually protect privacy. The second thing I would like to point out is that there is reference in these, the three bullet points that specifically refer to privacy, every component of privacy rights, meaning including the right to access your personal information, which is articulated in law as to how it should be plus is interpretation in decisions. Secondly, the right to know what is done with your personal information. Three, the right to complain through accountability mechanisms. There is also reference to protection in relation to data security. And finally, there is the reference to the fact that the uh, data will be kept in Canada. So um, this actually, it, everything there is a seed to cover comprehensively the entire ambit of the right to privacy. I appreciate that privacy is a, is a central uh, issue that needs to be dealt with digital principles. I see that privacy is one of, of many. I mean, uh, Democratic accountability is something that Steve Diamond has, has reiterated recently. There's a question of, of 
of governance here. And there are many other rights, I would say, that, that come under the idea of, of, of democratic accountability and rights that um, don't appear here to be um, as well developed. So I wonder why privacy is so dominant here and, and what then is, is being left out. George. Yeah, Andrew, we're also um, undertaking uh, an exercise to consider appropriate remedies for the digital realm beyond the, the, the privacy-oriented ones. There's a phrase in law that there's no such thing as a right without a remedy. And so we're going through um, really a, a laundry list of all available remedies, understanding how they map onto the activities that will be you know, front and center here. Um, some of it is, you know, going to be within the purview of <coughs> Waterfront Toronto, particularly through the implementation agreements, so contractually. Um, others will be waiting for a topic that uh, your chair has written about uh, um, in the last number of months, the federal um, law reform on, for instance, privacy remedies, about talking about you know, meaningful federal remedies. I think that's been considered one of the, the holes in that, uh, in that regime. But we're absolutely, if you excuse the pun, we're going to cover the waterfront on remedies. What I would love <coughs> to do with this committee is maybe bring that here with some use cases. So what if the Canadian um, you know, data requirement is breached? Well, well what happens then in, in the real world? What, what's going to be a practical remedy, et cetera, et cetera? I just want to, again, just, for, again, just a process thing. Because you were kind of focused on the transparency, accountability, and responsibility. Um, again, those the, the five things that were in, in these circles were when we first went out with um, with these principles. Those were kind of what the principles were called. And it was kind of the feedback we got was that it just wasn't clear to to people what what uh, what that actually meant. So the like principle three is literally a, tr a translation of transparency, accountability, and responsibility, trying to just explain in, in a single sentence um, what what was in, intended to be encapsulated um, by by uh, by those three words, trying just just to make it a more yeah. friendly and, and, and kind of readable piece. Well, yeah, I see principle three as about transparency, and uh, but the question of how of a ro robust regime of accountability isn't um, well, the word accountable is in there. So it, yeah, no, but yeah. but there's many ways to describe the process. But that's what the guidelines, of course. Right? But we're, we're on you know we're on five sentences right now, right? You know, and, and, no. and they need to be developed. In I mean, I don't disagree with you, Andrew. We need yeah. an accountability framework. And, yeah, and we need remedies and all those things. But right. uh, I mean, I, I see the word accountable here, and I'm, I'm struggling with I'm struggling with okay. the passion of your objection. Well. <laughs> so, 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 so honestly, I, am. I know. I know. Okay. Fair, fair enough. But if yeah. I can just jump in, because I think you know, and Vance kind of identified number three. To me, part of this is first of all, principles should be short, right? Uh, what is it that's important that we're trying to address? So we're not going to get into all the explanation of how we're going to force no. those principles in a principle. Uh, but if I was to go to the public and you know say, okay, do you understand? If, Transparency, accountability, and responsibility, or do you understand number three? I think the public would say, understand number three. Yeah. And that, I think, is important because this is a bit about explaining to the public how we're protecting them, right? Scott, uh, well, sorry, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people that wanted to yeah, okay. chime in, and I see you, Chantal. Let, let me get a couple of panel members' sure. uh, perspectives, and I had uh, Kevin yeah. here and Diane on the phone, Curtis, myself. Oh, okay, I'm trying to make this short. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different track. I'm just curious. Can you explain to me again how, like, how are we going to use this going forward? What's it going to inform? Um, 
because I don't want to be flippant about saying, hey, they look great if, you know, they are just a set of guidelines, but if it becomes, you know, a set of, of regulations or obligations or, or whatever, I think we should know that in advance. And just sorry, and just to supplement that, Diane's question was, what is the goal of having the principles? Which is, yeah. I think, consistent with that question. So the principles are helping to frame our discussions and helping to frame how we're developing the guidelines. So they are meant to be, if you will, guiding principles that underpin how we are operating. So again, it was so the public could understand kind of the parameters by which, what, what are the guideposts for Waterfront Toronto as we're considering digitally enabled solutions on the waterfront? <coughs> These are the general principles. I mean, the public, we had very warm feedback from it at our last, not just the digital consultation, but the public consultation on, on Keyside, where they said, there was one woman who actually stood up and she says, you know, I'm reading these principles and if this is how this project is progressing, I feel comfortable that Waterfront Toronto has their eye on how to protect us. So that was a very, I think, positive message of how people could see how the principles were being applied in the conversations that we were having as Waterfront Toronto. So they're, they're essentially guiding principles that will complement these other pieces that will come forward. And will those other pieces that come forward, will they have teeth at some point? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> if I can just jump in here, because uh, this, this will be important to guide us into the Im implementation agreements that we actually have with Sidewalk should the project go forward, right? So it'll say, you know, these are the things that are important for us to protect. <laughs> and where in the implementation agreements do you have remedies that are significant enough to change the behavior? Like if it's small, it's not going to matter to a, a large international company but if it's significant enough then people can say well there's a remedy that actually will make a difference so I think these principles will will to you know the public say this is what's important for us to protect the discussion below will be how are we protecting that to your point and I think it will end up in the implementation agreements because we'll say if you deviate from the agreement on how we expect you to manage the data collection or data sharing, here's what will happen. And we'll have to have teeth around that. So the next layer down, I mean, if you if you flip to page 75 on the example of the draft guidelines, you'll start to see the very specific measures of just one small excerpt that I put in there so you can begin to see the level of detail we're going at. And then there will be legal clauses around those in those agreements that will have ties right to the remedies and so on as well. So these pieces have to be stitched all together. We're just going down the pathway, and this is how we're framing it. Should, do I don't want to tell what it's built on. So I wanted, the information I wanted to impart to uh, complement this is that there are existing accountability structures that we have absolutely no choice to respect because they are in law. There will be three types of actors, possibly, in the key side. Number one, governments directly. Number two, governments via an outsourced supplier. Number three, a commercial business on its own. The first two types of actors being governments alone or governments via an outsourced supplier come under the accountability mechanisms of the public sector, which include, number one, legislative authority to do X or Y. Do you have it? If you don't, you can't do it. Number two, annual reports on activities. Number three, recourses. Number four, privacy impact assessments that are mandatory for any use of personal information. Number five, algorithmic impact assessments for any use, for example, of algorithms. And you have to report to parliament every year on how you've done that. For the standalone commercial business, you have to designate an official who is responsible for personal information in your business. You have to make sure that you inform all of your customers exactly what you do with their personal data. You have to make sure that any contract with another supplier must contain protection clauses for personal information while it's transferred so that it has a comparable level of protection. You also have to offer complete mechanisms and you also have to offer to tell people that they have a mechanism to the commissioners, plus you have to give access, and that applies to both types of institutions. What I wanted to say is that there is a pre-existing infrastructure of accountability that we can certainly supplement 
but that we cannot go below of. Um, all right, okay. and there's a lot of discussion online that I want to be able to try to build in as well. Uh, Karen. Uh, sure. So I think, um, uh, coming from the government perspective, I think it's important <coughs> to remember that these guidelines kind of signal to anyone that's going to engage in this space that these are things that matter to Waterfront Toronto. I think that, like, the fact that there's such a focus to privacy, that's a great signal. And I know that there's a lot of work to be done, teeth to sink in. Um, but I just want to kind of, from a government perspective, this is a great step forward in the right direction. I think something that I did notice, and maybe it's part of the umbrella of what you've already included, is just there's a lot of, of um, a focus on uh, privacy, protecting privacy, understanding your privacy protections, how your data is being used. But there's not too much language looking around user uh, empowerment, like can I opt in out of things? Uh, so I, I would like to, I would love to see some of that language included. And for principle one, I kind of wondered the difference between equal access versus benefit equally from an accessibility perspective um, in, um, in, in tech products that in, in conversations I've had. Uh, they said that equal access is, is, is a way to show that they won't just have access to the solution, but that they will be able to use it in the same way as everybody else um, in, and instead of necessarily benefiting equally. It's just a small kind of wording suggestion. But again, from a legal perspective, that can also have some things that I don't know. I'm sure you chose the wording you chose for a certain way. But that's, uh, that's my only comment. Uh, Diane, on the phone, you, you posted several things online. Would you like to <laughs> comment? It's, yes, apologies for the multiple posts. I find the character limit is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess. A lot of my questions come back to, you know, at a high level, I think that the five circles on the left do cover more ground than the five sentences on the right of the slide. Now, whether they're more um, understandable, I, I think there's, you know, more work to do if we're going to take what's on the left and, and really distill it into something that's more understandable, that covers the same ground. When I look at the actual table of contents, however, again, I think it is missing some headings that we definitely need around things like um, the longevity of the software and around things like the fact that there are going to have to be compromises made when we're looking at access and openness and that side of things that's in direct competition many times with privacy and so i think we need to build in really that overall goal as the theme that runs through it, that's the standard for that compromise. And so I would like to see the principle um, address more of what was originally covered in very few words, perhaps to their detriment. And I think especially if we're going to have principles, we should be organizing a lot of our table of contents around those principles um, rather than having them be a, a separate sheet of paper. So I didn't see in the, the draft table of contents really any of the principles except myself being able to associate the different words. Okay, okay. Take that on board. Uh, Chris? Um, I wanted to just maybe, whenever you're coming up with these things, it's always tough because like one word can be written about for pages. Um, so I want to pick on the word open. Um, I think open can mean lots of different things. Like, and I listed a few as examples here, but we could mean open processes to develop standards. We could mean open standards. We could mean open source, we could mean open licensed IP, uh, we could mean open APIs, or we could just mean open for business. Um, and I think in different contexts at different 
layers of the digital architecture. We probably actually mean all those things. Um, so I think it's great that it, we're not saying shall be closed, unethical, and prone to failure. Um, <laughs> so we've narrowed the universe. That's good. But I think there's still a lot of, um, I guess, open questions to me about sort of how open is applied and what the implications are to the, the business model that flows from this. Yes, and I guess further to my point, I think a lot of that is a compromise, right? If we say in the principles or in in our goals that absolutely every aspect has to be open, then there's no economic viability for a lot of things. And so I guess the that spirit of compromise or the fact that we recognize that not all of these things can perfectly coexist at all times is is something that you know it's great to have goals but how do we store things um, in a in a more realistic way and I think openness is a great example I'm I also Resiliency, that's another word that I find that's going to be hard. Right? It's going to be hard to define and it's going to mean very different things to different people, right? Uh, Pamela? Yeah, a question about the audience for the principles. Like, is the spirit of these the, the ideas that it's like a calling card? So when people, before they come and knock on your door and say, hey, we want to be a collaborator. Yes. So you're, it's like a, it's like a dating ad in a way. Like, it's like, this is the kind of stuff that we're looking Essentially for. Essentially it. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I use this a little bit too much, but City of Boston's Smart City Playbook, for example, is worth having a look at in terms of its language. Like, it's got six plays. Stop selling sal sending salespeople. Solve real problems for real people. Don't worship efficiency better decisions, not just better data, platforms that make us go, hey, and towards a public private, um, towards a public privacy policy. So that playbook is intended to send a signal about if you want to come to us, here are some basic conditions you need to meet. And so I think the, the principles that are presented, there's way more backstop stuff about the stuff that you don't want to do. And the blue bubble in the middle, the ethical responsible one, is the one that's the most aspirational. But I think I understand the need for the backstop, but the aspirational piece might need to be turned up as well, which is to, to pitch what kinds of partnerships you want. And I, I think the other thing I'll say is that for a long time, Waterfront Toronto has been really clear about communicating its sustainability goals since its inception. And you've led, I think, in really thoughtful ways. And I, I, part of it is maybe because I was there for the development of both of the the framework, so I'm assuming this is a parallel framework to something like that, which is to help set the team. We'll actually nest in our innovation framework. Yeah. So, you know, I think like the first one, you know, we talked about how we're a city with a back against the lake and we're trying to make a waterfront for all. And, you know, I think that more open aspirational language needs to accompany the other bits too. So, so what I was just saying to Michael is I think what we're going to do, although this has gone through consultation, we have an opportunity through our next round of consultation in January to bring a revised version of the principles with the guidelines through to the public. We will take this feedback on board and we will come through with some more. Chantelle? I just wanted the uh, DSAP to think of a few things. First of all, very important point on obtained consent <coughs> in the world of privacy. When we talk about strong privacy protections, that's the first thing we think about. So I'm putting to you whether, <coughs> indeed, in my world, the <coughs> sentence strong privacy protections yeah. would include your very important point on opt-in. So I put that to the board to DSAP to consider. Secondly, resilience. Um, if, Throughout my life as uh, working on privacy, technologists have told me to use resilience rather than security because they believe that is the true test and therefore I would put to you that that may be indeed the word you want to stick with. Okay, uh, <laughs> Charles, Mark, Karen, I'm going to say one small thing and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, so 
I, I understand, Christina, you've actually put these principles in front of us more than once. Uh, and But this is good that we're having a, a good in-depth conversation now about them. Uh, I also recognize that whenever you're going through an exercise, be it values or principles, you're always vacillating between the general and the specific. You get too general and, and it's it's people don't understand what it's about. You get too specific and you leave out things. Or the completeness or the emptiness of something <coughs> that means that it's not not enough nuance in it. And I know that you sort of going back and forth on that. So I recognize the effort that's gone to try to make these understandable to the general public. But I do see, for example, that principle number two, I mean, I, I felt there was a couple of things missing around this, the idea of the public digital infrastructure principle, that the, some things should be in the hands of the public around uh, it, it being part of the principle, or the fact that multiple parties can participate, a participatory <coughs> model around building. It's not just about receiving the digital solution, but building the digital solution. And how are, can we incorporate that maybe a little bit more explicitly in these principles? And then finally, uh, in terms of moving forward, maybe when they're presented to address some of the questions that the panel's raised around how are they being used, you know, how will they be used, maybe we can put them in the document, how do they, how do they inform the intelligent community guidelines, how do they connect it, and uh, so that they're not something that's seen as a, hey, these are a bunch of values that are really great, we're going to put them on a shelf and we're going to pull them out to make everyone feel good, but we're not actually on a day-to-day -day basis going to really use them, and so I, I think it's having them incorporated or referred to in, in everything that we're doing going forward from a water control perspective. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build on on, um, uh, on Curtis's point on, on the word open and, and what it means. Um, so I see in the, if I try and parse that down the table of contents, I see open data, data exchanges, and cooperatives, and that's kind of the only open that's there. And I, I just think there's a whole lot more elaboration that's going to be needed and probably another section in here related to open standards and economic models um, and architecture that are going to be important in the guidelines. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just coming back to that economic development question. We're just too real estate focused and not enough big picture economic development focus. And, and I look at the advisors you've got, and I'm still anxious that you've got people who really are into the true economic development potential of this, as opposed to the economics of job creation and spin-offs from construction and economic impact analysis and all of that stuff, um, which I don't think is where the, the richness here lies. So I, I, we need to take that word open and blow it up into a much bigger, bigger uh, conversation. But I'm, I'm I'm okay with it in the principles being where it is, providing that blow up happens in the guidelines. Um, I think uh, the question Expansion around, is what yep. it is, I wish I was <laughs> taking note. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my, my question would be about uh, language and audience intended. Um, you're talking about going out to public consultation with this, and I really appreciate the spirit of the public understanding the guidelines that you're putting forward. But if it's not resonating with the tech community or the people that the guidelines are intended to, um, then then they won't necessarily be, be the same way. Because like the privacy language, that's great. Um, not every company has, I mean they should, but not every company has those kinds of expertise on the table. So making sure that that language resonates. The principles are more for the public. Okay. The guidelines are going to be more for the, the tech community okay. that would be interfacing yeah. with the project. Yeah, then I would just recommend that when you do develop those guidelines that they're, the, the consultation process focuses on tech community. Very much so. So the tech community, if you look at, um, we, I haven't even gotten through those slides yet, but the focus is really on the engagement with the industry on those guidelines as opposed to how we flipped it and the engagement was with public on the principles. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the public still, we're going to give them a chance to understand what's in those guidelines and see how we've translated the principles into the guidelines, but that's not, in fact, the focus of going out for the guidelines. Okay. And the language is very different. The treatment of the topics is very different in between the two documents as well. Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap here. I think it's been, a, that's been a very robust conversation. Before you flip, I was just going to Sorry. comment. I have my own little nitpicky language issue just to highlight that I'm not sure that local control in principle five is what you actually need. Um, if sidewalk, ha local data residency is not the same as, lo as, data, as local data controls. So sidewalk, I mean, I know they may have a, a Canadian-based company, but uh, we, wouldn't we wouldn't claim that even if, 
if sidewalk controlled the data here that it was under local control. We envision it being controlled by foreign entity through a subsidiary. Well, but what we are concerned with is that it that it resides locally to ensure that it will be subject to local laws. And so I struggled a little bit with that. Oh. But there's a question of public versus private. There is, and it's the democratically accountable control of data that is actually more what was trying to be drive, driven at there with the, the local piece. So again, we will bring these back as part of the next round with the, yeah. the guidelines. I, th I think the local control referred more to the systems than the, yeah, the, no, the I, data piece of that. Yeah, but, no, yeah, I, 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 I take your point. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I mean, all this highlights that we can identify specific words that you know you take shots at. This looks like a little bit like a dartboard almost up on the left, <laughs> which is unfortunate because I don't think that's the that's obviously not the goal. Uh, and I think if we can supplement it through um, through the guidelines and the like, mm -hmm. as along with the use cases that was described, I think it'll give people a bit better understanding of how this actually fleshes out. And I think the other thing is is just making sure that <clears throat> the core of what is here has been shaped by consultation. So we want to make sure that we honor the consultation that has occurred thus far and still add that clarification. So that's just to leave that with you, that that will guide how we revise these to bring them back to you. If I could just, Mike, if I can just add, because the earlier comment that was made about the trade-offs, I do think that's a good point to make. This is very complex, and there are going to be some challenges around the push and pull on some of the principles. And having a couple examples in there, uh, I think, helps the public understand that it's not easy. That's why everybody's grappling with it. But some of these principles about you know government having control over some of those decisions are important. Right? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So now, nesting into the guidelines, and I have been taking detailed comments about the comments that have come in thus far about things that maybe you're missing in the uh, table of contents, just to take them back through, and, and those were not the complete full table of contents yet, so that's great. So I'll add those. I, I just want to go through sort of the context and the purpose for the, the guidelines, the proposed structure, uh, the timeline and process for development. Just a quick example, I won't go into the detail, you can read those, and then just secure DSAP's role and participation in the development of those guidelines. So the context of this, uh, Pamela mentioned the earlier work that we've done on our sustainability guidelines. And I think one of the things that uh, this group may not have full exposure on is our Waterfront Toronto Resilience and Innovation Framework, which actually guides the work that we do here. Uh, and it predates the work that we were doing with Sidewalk Labs. And it goes through and it talks about our commitment to sustainability and resilience, as well <laughs> as how we engage on innovative projects, our intelligent community projects that we've done in the past and so on. It also sets out a goal uh, framework and an action plan until 2030 and how we would achieve some of our, our targets that we've established for the corporation. One of the fundamental pieces to our resilience and innovation framework that underpins how we deliver to that, that framework is our minimum green building requirements. And that was an area that Waterfront Toronto predates me, and Meg, you can jump in at any time, really set the new standard in terms of how um, high-performance buildings would be built in the waterfront, and our developers have to build towards those standards. Uh, and they are continuously updated. They're going through another update right now just to align to the new Toronto Green Standards. So it takes into consideration the frameworks that exist around it, but also looks to raise the bar in terms of what's delivered here on the waterfront. So similar to what we've done in our sustainability uh, realm, we're looking to do the same type of work on digital. So this does not discount the work that all of our, our government partners and regulators have done in this space. It's how do we actually increase what's being done here in the waterfront in terms of things like privacy protection, but how do we set a new bar even in terms of the intellectual property approach to doing these projects and things of that nature. So um, these principle or sorry these guidelines would apply to any proponent that wants to do work in the waterfront so not just sidewalk labs and one of the things that i mentioned earlier why industry consultation is going to be so important on this piece is there's likely going to be some tiered thresholds that different players are actually able to achieve and we don't want to make this a disincentive for people to actually come to the waterfront to innovate as well so there's still ways of actually raising the bar while accommodating an ability for small Canadian companies to, to play in the space, fresh startups to actually play in the space, as well as you know some of the, the big tech companies that obviously we're, we're grappling with at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> we have taken what we learned through the civic labs and the public consultation sessions, particularly in terms of the concerns that were raised by the public of you know 
in a smart city space as this kind of new frontier is being built, what is the public genuinely concerned about and how do we actually build that into a set of guidelines to make sure that we're we're doing the, um, the right thing in terms of raising areas that perhaps legislation has not yet caught up to or regulation has not yet caught up to to create an environment that people would be comfortable living and visiting it, uh, in the waterfront. So um, in many cases, they, you'll see that there would be guidelines established and that proponents would have to exceed existing laws and regulations in order to actually get the permission to do a project here in the waterfront. And that's not dissimilar to what we've done in the sustainability space as well. Uh, and this is why we need to work very closely with our government partners to understand you know, how this fits and nests within things. So this is just a, a bit of a draft proposed structure following our minimum green building requirements structure. And a lot of that context and aspiration that Pamela talked about earlier would really start to be woven in through the background and the approach and what we're trying to achieve in there. Um, there's also a jurisdictional scan that would need to be provided. And this, of course, would be updated on an ongoing basis in terms of what applicable legislation is in force and effect on each of these areas. Uh, what regulatory approvals would need to be in place. Also, uh, what regulators are actually holding the accountability levers in these particular pieces. And then working through digital governance. And as I said, I've taken notes on all the feedback thus far that's been received on things that might be missing, uh, but specifically around things like transparency, consent and user control. And then intellectual property, looking at essentially an intellectual property strategy that unleashes innovation in the waterfront as well. Uh, and really looks at things like the patent pledge and how would a patent pledge actually function within the waterfront? Um, how is project specific IP where the public sector is actually developing things in concert with the private sector be shared amongst the players and, and start to set a level playing field of expectations for anyone who comes here. Uh, and then obviously understanding what the remedies would need to be in terms of if you're doing a test bed and things don't go well, what are the remedies and recourse that would need to happen to protect the public interest of what's happening here, not just the private actors that would be uh, doing work here. And then the review process, we've talked a little bit about the fact that you know this digital and the physical space, there isn't quite a parallel process. So the review process of how new projects would be approved and how that knits within the, the urban environment would also be codified in this document. And it would speak specifically to when submissions would be due, the role of DSAP, how DSAP would actually become uh, active in the implementation phase. And this would take a lot of learnings from what we've done in our design review panel in terms of process, but then build on that given the realities of a digital environment. Uh, and then very importantly, and I think this concept has come up in a few places, is there's a lot of, of words that we use that have many different meanings and really having a clear set of definitions that people can cross check against to make sure that they're interpreting what we're intending correctly throughout this as well. So things like resiliency and, and so on uh, being very clearly laid out. Can I ask one question? Sure. This? So one of, the, one of the things that um, I think is a bit, it, it sort of would cut through this, this whole thing is the distinction between digital public infrastructure and digital private infrastructure. So for example, data generated from a private condo may have certain treatments under each of these sections versus like data generated from a street light or an intersection might have a completely different set of treatments under the, these yep. frameworks. So maybe almost like definitionally, here's the types of yep. data and then, then they get applied through the sections. For sure. And we've actually, in the early parts of it, um, we even have, you know, as a private actor operating as a private actor delivering private service, this is the types of things that would apply to you. As a private actor, sir, you're acting as an agent or a vendor of government, this is what actually would apply to you. So it it's starts to flesh that out and it is a consistent theme through all of these things as well. That's a question. Uh, just on the digital governance, and I'm not sure if it goes in here, but uh, really around a couple, a couple of things. One is the uh, how the technologies are actually developed and by whom. So Myth, perhaps methodologies, or uh, maybe that's too tactical here, but it's just I'm not sure if it's addressed in this. Uh, and then, secondly, the idea of maintenance and resilience. Yep. So, who maintains it and over the long term? And it should be a uh, consideration. I will add that right to the thing. It was intended to be there as part of the digital governance piece for sure. Okay. I think digital governance is another place where accountability should be made explicit. It should actually say transparency and accountability. I caught that when I was looking at it earlier. 
Yeah, I mean, they're quite they're separate. I see. But it's, it's accountability that that transparency is mainly in aid of. But there needs to be, and it goes beyond the question of uh, legislation and regulatory approvals, particularly if we're going to make uh, develop certain sort of standards or norms that go well beyond what I regard as a, a rather limited legal regime that we have now, which is. Um, well out of date, and I think this is a big opportunity for us. The other piece that's also missing in here that I caught uh, going through the review while I was listening is the accessibility section. So just so you know, that has not been missed in my, my you, other you, notes. You, you I just you didn't do. transport it to the slide, so I apologize for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the timelines, I think this is really important to understand, and we I superposed it on the earlier timeline slide around sort of the MIDP process, but these are two separate processes. Uh, there will be preliminary guidelines that are going to be available for this group as well as for the consultation process with industry available in November. Those do need to go through to our government partners for comments as well. Um, where you see the colored, the solid color, darker pieces, that means that there would be sort of a face-to-face -face interaction that would occur during that period. The lighter shades would be more of an asymmetrical comment period that would be happening. So for industry to have a chance to respond to those guidelines and so on, and to be able to feed back to Waterfront Toronto, and then us reporting back to industry what we've heard through this process of these market soundings. Um, you'll notice that the community engagement pieces is flipped. Right? So the focus is actually more on hearing from industry in this piece, and then the community would have a chance to hear what we're learning from industry and how this actually brings the principles to life. DSAP, you'll see this will come back through multiple different times into DSAP, uh, and DSAP will have a significant comment period. This is separate and apart from a work stream that I would work with the delegated subcommittee to work through. Uh, and then our board would also see a presentation of these guidelines or a format of these guidelines at certain checkpoints as well before major uh, releases of the guidelines would be brought to life. <clears throat> so the notion would be is that there would be these preliminary guidelines to begin the conversation and frame any, any interim projects that would happen, although we don't anticipate anything coming up between now and March, but if there was a pilot that was brought forward that was unique uh, in November. Then by March, we will have completed that first cycle of full consultation and we will finalize the first set of guidelines that will be equivalent to a version 1.0, like what we've done with our minimum green building requirements. Through the process that we have with the uh, potential negotiation of any implementation agreements and then further response that we would receive from that version one, the goal would be that by October, we would have a version 1.1, if necessary, that would actually serve to guide any implementation agreements that we would be pursuing with Sidewalk Labs. So just so to knit those two things together, why I've actually taken it out to the October timeframe is so that people understand that there would be that continuous iteration uh, to make sure that we are landing on best practices that would guide those implementation agreements. And then this piece, just like what we do with our sustainability pieces and our minimum green building requirements, would be um, reviewed and reflected upon annually to see if there are major changes that need to happen. Like our minimum green building requirements are being substantially overhauled because the City of Toronto has new green standards that they launched last year. So we want to make sure that they're fully aligned with those and not competing with them. Um, the other thing and the uh, fundamental underlying principle <clears throat> is that because we're in an environment that's changing right now with governments, with them all going through their own consultation and strategy work, whatever the higher level of requirement that would need to be adhered to would be the one that would actually apply to the waterfront. So if for some reason in the middle of our review cycle, governments actually leapfrog the standard within the waterfront Toronto guidelines, just like what happens with our, our um, minimum green building requirements, the higher standard would apply. So we would never actually be in a position that there's lesser of a set of protections within the waterfront for any of this work. Um, there's also a missing bar here, for some reason the, the new deck actually didn't get shown, there is a public consultation process that would actually be nested within the second review guidelines as well. So we would also go back up to the public on that piece. And then just some sample of the type of, of detail that we would get into, and again these would then get translated into any agreements that we'd have, but by way of example, uh, let's look at the second from last bullet. Proponents will not use facial recognition facial recognition technology in a solution. In the event that facial recognition technology is used, there will be a higher standard of review of the solution and the proponent must propose clear notices to affected individuals. So 
all of this would go through what those processes would be and we would have the sort of heightened process actually uh, codified in, in the guidelines as to the process section as well. Um, so we, I, we have about 22 pages of these guidelines to put forward in draft form that go into a significant level of detail on each of those issues uh, that the panel would have a chance to start to begin to engage with as a draft. So it's not a blank slate. I don't want to start knitting on each individual one of these. This is just for sample only. So what I was hoping for today from DSAP is that the Architecture and Standards Subcommittee would work with Waterfront Toronto's management to advance the draft guidelines and likely based on the previous conversation, bring back a, a revised version of the principles to this group. And then there would be key presentations to the full DSAP as followed in January, March, and May as described. And there would be an open period for DSAP to comment between uh, January <coughs> and June that would continue on an ongoing basis on this particular piece. So essentially, the bulk of what I, I'm looking for today is that there be a delegation to the Architecture and Standards Subcommittee, which I believe was uh, Charles, Curtis, Kevin, and Mark, to continue to develop the guidelines with Waterfront Toronto. Uh, any comments or violent objections from the people who just got named? <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> no, I, I'm just absolutely delighted. The, uh, <laughs> um, the, the one comment I would make, and it, it just struck me out of the sample, um, and, and to pick up on Curtis's point about private infrastructure versus public infrastructure, um, I, I do understand the, the anxiety around facial recognition in public spaces. Um, but on the other hand, um, I'm also seeing office buildings and condos start to use facial recognition for access purposes yep. in, into their facilities. Um, and that's presumably done with you know, the approval, vote, consent, whatever the court, condo court. So I, I, I think we may have a different sense of evolution between private and public, and, and we have to be there careful are. careful not to yeah. you know, impose a set of standards on people that, that are willing to do something different. There are, and there are also mechanisms around express consent and so on that all get interstitched <coughs> to all of this too. Absolutely. So I, anyway, just to amplify on, 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 because those, those discussions have been separated enough yet in, in the, uh, in the whole dialogue around the Keyside project, around the private versus public infrastructure. Um, yeah, I mean, this is interesting work and, and uh, an important role for, for us to play. Uh, I wonder about assigning it, um, and I guess it's our job to figure out ourselves how we're going to take on this um, on this task, which, um, uh, but I wonder why you think the architecture group is appropriate given, or most appropriate, not to say that it isn't, because there's certainly a lot of intersection, but, but uh, much of this is explicitly about digital governance, and um, that's something I think that uh, the architecture group, is my understanding, um, has not, I mean, it's, we, I think I was also part of that group, actually, um, but met um, to discuss, you know, actual architecture of the proposed systems of the digital layer. Um, but I think what this, what you're proposing here is, is somewhat broader. So I just <coughs> wonder um, whether um, that might be an, a, a, might be appropriate to expand the frame from from this term architecture. So I actually expanded the frame a little bit with the notion of making sure it was an architecture and standards working group. Yeah. And we do have a conversation coming at the end of the agenda around the composition of who sits on those working groups in case people wanted sure. to opt in because we have new members that actually maybe weren't a part of those conversations in the past. Um, and I think. The fact of the matter is, is that those working group meetings are the place for this conversation to start and the, the broader DSAP is always welcome to be part of those conversations uh, and whether it be through actually attending virtually or a part of those meetings, that's always an option. But really we need some place to, to find a home and to really start digging into this to help management. Yeah, I think what's important is, is that we have a workable group that's of a size that can do the work, yeah. whatever we call it, it doesn't matter. 
as long as it's the right people that are working on it. Yeah. I was trying to not start up another ad hoc committee, yeah. but if we yeah. wanted to, we could do that simply as an ad hoc, but it, it seems better to nest it within a, a standing committee. All right. Uh, well, so we'll have the chance to revisit committee composition, working group composition, but about an hour, it's the last thing that's on our agenda, but good for now. So, we're good. All right, uh, we're, we're quite behind time, but we'll see you guys <laughs> shake out. Um, so we've got responses to the DSAP preliminary comments from Waterfront Toronto Sidewalk Labs, which included a lengthy document in, um, in our materials, as well as the discussion of the DIA, which we now know will come until next week. And you're part of this as well as Sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um, for this first part, we're essentially going to split it off. We kind of because the answers were developed separately. We kind of want to have discussion with Waterfront Toronto and a discussion with the sidewalk on, on their respective responses. Um, so I'll start. I mean, obviously, I'll start with, with Waterfront Toronto's responses. Um, Again, I, I we keep going back to this. You know, we appreciate the we appreciate all, all the comments. So, the, the, the process we kind of we kind of went through again because there was this discussion of um, not every comment is kind of appropriate for for um, sidewalk to respond to or, or us to respond to um, we kind of went through an initial just uh, attempt to as assign comments to to one party or the other or both um, then we, we ran that ran that through the report writing working group to kind of make sure that there was at least some kind of alignment uh, that, that you, you agreed that uh, we, we had assigned them correctly and it kind of went from there. Um, for Waterfront Toronto's uh, work, the, the one thing I, I kind of want to, to emphasize is um, just kind of given that the, the state of the, the discussions that were, that were going on, kind of the state of this project, um, we didn't uh, reach, out, reach out to government partners to kind of have them feed into um, into the responses, um, we kind of felt it was it was, prelim it was you know uh, premature to uh, to have them involved. Um, so these response the, the responses that, that you have are from Waterfront Toronto exclusively, not not Waterfront Toronto and government partners. Um, so I, I suppose with that, I, I think the the Waterfront Toronto portion of this discussion may actually be quite quick because you know a lot of the, a lot of the reference a lot of the responses are kind of along the lines of that's 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 going to be addressed in the guidelines um, and, and trying to set out how the, how they're going to be responded to in the guidelines but um, uh, if, if anybody has either broad or specific comments on um, the responses that, that we gave um, I'm happy to Answer to the best of uh, to the best of my ability. Um, so I'll kind of open the floor. Yep. Anybody else go, go first? Um, I I made a number of of, of comments um, on the document, mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I'm told that there's a syncing error um, due to net, the network connection. So I can't actually uh, uh, see what I, I wrote then. But I'll just summarize very briefly. And one of the overall concerns I had about this is that um, a great deal of the, what's the sort of the, the core policy issues are deferred to the questions of the implementation agreements. And um, I've sort of alluded to this um, earlier, is that um, I think around policy questions, um, my understanding of, of, of the of implementation ag agreements is that uh, the big issues need to be resolved before you decide where you're going to build your highway, um, and the implementation agreements would be about you know like what sort of materials or you know where the off ramps are. And I think in this case we have a prior question of you know do we want a highway from here to there or you know do we want to build a railway? And those things need to be decided um, before we get into the implementation agreements. And that is my my uh, concern that we need to have a, a policy framework that's been you know, robust enough and developed through the, the appropriate process to decide those questions before you get to the, to, the, to the implementation agreements. And I didn't see much in here as to um, 
how you were going to do that um, or where that was going to fit. Um, and that's why I was, uh, my comment that you'll mm -hmm. probably read, um, about the over-reliance on implementation agreements in this, in your responses. So that's a sort of a general uh, comment. I've got a bunch of others that are specific. But yeah. Do you want to speak to that at all? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I take, uh, other than saying I, I, take, the, I take that point, um, I think it, it deals as well back to the guidelines that we'll be setting the table with the guidelines as well, but much before the implementation agreements. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I just, my thought would be, Andrew, whatever we feel should uh, come into the prior should go into the guidelines. Yes. No, I agree. You, so if there's issues that you think should be pulled forward, then yeah, speak up specifically. I'm sure you will. Yeah, I will, and I hope others will too. Are there others comments on the Waterfront Toronto response? Okay. In that case, turn it over to Sidewalk for it's a similar conversation. Perhaps there are more questions on their on their response. Jesse, what are you Yeah, Um, so just to start, I mean, to, I think you all saw the, the kind of cover letter that we provided with this, but just to, to again, really recognize and appreciate the commentary that you provided to us, I think, in the last session that we had with you, um, you know, you expressed a very clear desire to see um, direct responses to all the questions that, that you posed, and um, we hope that you see that we took that very seriously and uh, have put a lot of thought into the questions that you raised, and as has been stated earlier, um, we hope that you see that in the changes that have uh, resulted in the proposal um, that have been through the threshold issues resolution that um, much of the perspective that you brought um, has had a substantial influence on the project. Um, and you know, as we said, we, we, we look forward to sharing the DIA with you. We apologize that it's not available today, but um, we'll certainly have that to you next week. Um, we hope that document um, you know, further provides information that you're looking for. Um, a lot of the questions we provided uh, are based on the work that we've been doing uh, on that document, um, so uh, it's building on that work. Um, so we'd open up for any specific questions that you all would like to have further clarification on. Um, but just in terms of the overall approach, um, we really took the commentary extraordinarily seriously, um, and you know have done every effort that we could possibly uh, muster. We feel to really um, address specifically the questions that you've asked. Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, just I, I mean, I'm assuming you're you have taken whatever your commentary is here and have folded it into the DIA. And so <laughs> for me, the most relevant thing is to spend time on the DIA yeah. rather than, you know, yeah. Yeah. rather than, than going through this. That is now the, the relevant document. And, and I, I would assume all that's been brought forward. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, all yeah. I was going to say was through both Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs, thank you for taking the time to address, and, and I know how much time it takes, uh, to address each of the questions <laughs> and answer them fulsomely. Uh, I know that we've only received this recently. I have looked through it, but I would love to spend more time with the document. Or so. uh, and I think it probably makes sense that it should be a key input into our considerations of the DIA. We should put these all together. As exactly. one thing. So I don't have a lot of questions right now, particular to this. I think that there's field difference. Anyone online? Are there any any specific questions that you want to call out where you think there's either misunderstanding implied in the question or where you think there's still a divergence of view that is kind of worth talking through? Um, nothing explicitly comes to mind. I feel like the, you know, to the conversation that was the, that, that you all were having earlier, I think that um, you know, I think it's reflected in the responses to the questions. But I think, in fact, there's no, obviously no question that, that we are very strongly supportive of the shift that is taking place in terms of data governance and the leadership role that the waterfront and government stakeholders are taking on that, um, and the opportunity to actually think through the, the kind of 
digital architecture and the integration with the physical, um, and that sort of digital master planning, you know, as, as, as uh, Emily <coughs> has pointed out, I think these are things that um, I think that the, the nature of the discussion you all are having is precisely the right discussion. Um, and I think that many of the questions in many ways actually reflect that. Um, so I don't think there, there's nothing that explicitly uh, reflected a divergence, I think, with, um, you know, I think if you read through the questions, it's, it's quite clear that there was a lot of questions uh, that had quite pointed perspectives on elements of the MIDP. Um, there's substantial changes that have been made um, to this uh, various set of issues. And, um, that has hopefully addressed the, the divergences that existed. One of, one of the questions, one of the, one of the questions or that responses, uh, DSAP comment 17 was about whether or not Keyside was uh, big enough to deploy the digital infrastructure. And, and the response that you gave was that, well, yeah, we said some might be, some might not be. We're now focused uh, on key side and you have to evaluate what's feasible and what's not. Is, is that something that you get to see when we get this document or is that is that an ongoing process that you anticipate is going to take this, more time than that? Uh, this, I mean, this, this builds on the, the earlier conversation mm -hmm. which George was speaking to within the innovation plan. I mean, I think we, it is it is too premature to know that that uh, the specifics at this point based on the resolution at the end of last week. Um, so that won't be reflected in the DIA as the specific breakdown of which or which ones might not be viable at, a, at the Keysight scale. Um, that will be worked through through the innovation plan process. And, and that will be part of the discussion as to how we share that information with the panel uh, to have that context, right? So we're working on that issue now. I would imagine there would have already been a starting point because of the claims that you needed the larger space <coughs> to be effective that you would already know some of those technologies because you made the claim. So this probably have a list of ones that you knew right away, but there may have been other ones that you're going through. I think it's a question of appetite for prior investment. It's a more business question. Yeah, I mean to be to be clear, I think the you know, we will get into in this evaluation process the, the, where there is specific technological um, considerations regarding larger scale and, you know, that might be elements of network connectivity systems, that might be, you know, the relevance of certain types of mobility systems that a few square blocks might not have quite as much relevance. Um, but to, to, to Mark's point, you know, a lot of this is also related to the underlying economics that, um, you know, was factored into the, the MIT proposal in terms of the overall project and the, and the relationship between Keysight and Villiers. Um, and that is, will have a substantive impact on the overall um, innovation plan um, that we can move, you know, move forward with. Thanks. Um, one of the questions is 156 um, asks about uh, how much tax uh, Alphabet and subsidiaries um, paid in Canada in 2018 and also their earnings. And because this speaks to actually a controversy, I mean, actually, it's quite widespread, it's in Europe as well. Um, but I was curious by the answer because there was no direct reference to that substantively, and you basically deferred to um, Waterfront Toronto um, as kind of as your <laughs> arbiter. Do you think it's not uh, of, of, of where to sort of find an answer to that? Do you, do you, is that something that Sidewalk Labs doesn't want to answer, or you don't think it's appropriate for us to ask? Or I'm just curious as to why this um, is rather thin and very general answer to a, a very specific question. Lisa, I don't know if you'd like to take that question. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so one of the reasons that we deferred is that um, we do understand that Water for Toronto has a robust process. Um, and as we understand it and have been discussing with them, um, it seemed as if the more appropriate party, especially given the fact that um, the DSAP is the advisor to Waterfront, would be for Waterfront to address how it plans to vet um, vendors 
and so that was the reason for our deferral. Meg, did you want to speak at all to the due diligence process that we undertake before we enter into any contracts on a vendor in terms of reviewing their disclosures and things like that to make sure that we have a good grasp of how they have been operating? Well, we um, require all... Sorry, Meg. I'm going to ask you to just oh, stand I'm sorry. up again. Sorry. <clears throat> we require any of our partners to disclose to us um, a variety of pieces of information, financial information, legal information, um, any lawsuits that they're in. We um, use a variety of uh, venues through steering committees, um, IREC, the board, et cetera, to vet some of these things. So um, we're pretty thorough on, on how we um, take on our partners and to make sure that we're um, dealing with uh, entities that we know have financial backstops and um, they may be special purpose vehicles, but we would get a parental guarantee, that kind of thing, um, letters of credit, et cetera. So um, we make sure that we're dealing with um, parties who we know can accomplish what we're partnering on and can um, respond if anything goes awry. Yeah, I guess I'm not questioning that Waterfront Toronto has robust mechanisms for vetting um, you know, proponents and so on. Um, this question sort of comes out is a basic question that you probably get in public settings. I mean, it's a very straightforward question. And I would guess that if some citizen asks this, they're not going to be terribly satisfied with the answer that Waterfront has just, just given. I mean, is it zero, for instance? I mean, it has been claimed. I mean, can you... So one thing zero is the amount of tax that, just that, to be that Alphabet has paid in last year. I mean, this is... To be, to be clear, though, Sidewalk Labs is answering as Sidewalk Labs. They are not answering these questions on behalf of Alphabet or Google, and I think we need to be very clear about the fact that they are a distinct entity in the realm of answering these questions. So they are limited to what they can answer as a corporate entity as well. So, But if I can add, yeah. <clears throat> what is fair to ask is... When we look at the accountability measures that you know we've engaged in in earlier discussions, that if the public asked uh, Waterfront Toronto, what provisions have you put into place to ensure that the entity that you're holding accountable has significant assets uh, to actually address that? That's a fair question. Trying to get into you know should somebody pay tax on. Different, different questions, right? Oh, I, didn't have I struggle honestly, Andrew, with the relevance of that question, the evaluation. I mean, if 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 the because so let's 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 not dance around the topic yeah. here too much. Um, the um, if private entities, <coughs> public entities, uh, arrange their affairs to minimize taxation. There's no question about that, and the world as a whole has failed to deal with that. I mean, that's 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 understood. People are. Yeah. You know, whether it's Apple or Alphabet or whoever, you know, uh, going through Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so that's that's a big public policy issue. Sure. Now, why we would burden this particular valuation process with that question, I I, I don't see it. Well, I guess I just don't see it. Okay, I guess for for me, it speaks to the question of whether uh, statements by Sidewalk Labs that it is really interested in improving the quality of life for Torontonians, which is central um, to their claims, I mean, whether that stands up, com you know, in relation to their wider corporate um, and, and, enterprise. And, and, and how much extra and tax did you volunteer to pay last year? Um, I, I'd be actually happy to, to share my tax. I don't have no, no, did you vol how much extra no, no, tax okay, did you, no, you, know, no, did no, you volunteer no. to pay, Andrew? Because that's essentially what you're asking them to do, is to go beyond the tax code beyond the regimes that, that the governments yeah. legislate and, and, and they appropriately follow. So, so you know, I just don't see it, Andrew. Well, I think, I think I, you're in a space I, that you should stay out of. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting response <laughs> because yeah. I think there's a lot of people who would have that question and I didn't, I, mean, I guess I posed that question, I didn't pull it out of thin air because people are asking. Right. That's a that's a relevant general question for all tech companies. Yeah, I agree. But this particular one is is seeking to take, you know, on responsibility anyway. for this area. Anyway, we, we have a difference of opinion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, George. Yeah. No. I think. You know, I, I would just again I use the earlier example. I think if we keep it more narrow to the project and ensuring the viability of the project and the public interest, we don't want to pick up any. Uh, 
should one of their suppliers in an innovation uh, drop out, uh, and all of a sudden there's an economic burden left for somebody to deal with uh, the commercial entity that hasn't completed its work, we want to make sure that they cover that off. I don't, I'm, I'm speaking personally, it uh, goes to Mark's comment. I, you know, I don't want to solve all of the world's problems through this panel. I don't think that's what the panel was established for. Uh, I think there are other questions that people can ask, but not relevant to the project itself. Yeah. I think if, I think where the and this sort of came out in the public consultations as well that maybe the root of the question, Andrew, is around the. I mean, we, I, I heard some of this from the public as well. The the element that they they don't trust a sidewalk because of the association with Alphabet and Google. And so. Is there a way that we could make, how do we address that question and make it germane to this project? So I don't think tax is the way of doing it, but is there a way of, of how do we address the, how do we, how do we get reassurance around that, around some of the things that, uh, some of the practices that perhaps Google and Apple do that lead to the public feeling the way that they do, and then they apply that feeling to this project. And I don't know exactly how we do that, but, uh, but we, we can't, uh, it's, way beyond our scope to be addressing the taxation issue, absolutely. Um, but it is something maybe we should consider in terms of when we're doing our, our evaluation. I can so, share with you that in my preliminary discussions with Nicole on the consultation, she is looking at um, pulling out a little more on that issue. So what I would suggest is let the consultation draw some insight that we can share with Sidewalk, ourselves, panel, um, and then you can better, I think, define where we go with that issue. I just don't want to boil the ocean. That's my yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are others more specific questions that we asked uh, on that that theme. I just picked that this one of tax because it's it's a very simple and straightforward one. Anyone else? Okay. Um, uh, so I understand that with the threshold issues, some of this has changed now around terminology, but I'd still be interested in hearing from you um, why terminology like open space versus public space or urban data versus dysregulated data. You've mentioned it in previous meetings, but I'm interested particularly um, how your thinking around that has changed to put it off the table. Or which one for well, um, I, I can start with the, yeah. the, the public space one just and that's I hope the answer makes very clear the the choice of open space is in no way is meant to try to suggest a privatization of public space and to try to provide a different definition of what public space would be in this project um, categorically um, there is a within the kind of deep in the weeds urban planning public space discussion there is a discussion about how do you capture the variety of publicly accessible spaces um, that have different landowners? Um, you know, and, and what our intent is in this project has been to try to actually foster a greater degree of public access beyond just public space, mm -hmm. and how do you try to describe that in a meaningful way? So open space was chosen as a word. Mm -hmm. It's not our word, that's a common term that has been used to describe this um, as a way to capture the various types of publicly accessible spaces, including public space and all of its classic and important definitions. Um, in terms of urban data, I don't know if you or Lisa, I'd also be happy to speak to it. I mean, I think we heard very loud and clear in the kind of like through the threshold resolution issues that you know, that there's urban, well, first of all, through the consultation process that urban data as a term was kind of confusing and kind of brought in a lot of different um, exists, includes different existing legal definitions of data. And with Waterfront Toronto, you know, taking the lead on that piece of data governance, the direction was really that it doesn't make sense. It continues, it would be confusing for us to continue to refer to urban data as a concept. Um, I think the, it, the the term urban data was also, we were trying to respect what we heard in some of these early days connotations that like data collected in a smart, quote unquote, I'm gonna put air quotes, smart city context should be rightly considered a public asset. And so how do you kind of start to capture that idea, um, but urban data is no longer a term that we're gonna be using going forward as it reflects the kind of resolution of the threshold issues. So to be very explicit there as well, the term urban data wasn't intended to try to yeah. 
it was in fact responsive to what we were hearing, which is a, a sentiment that there is a desire to try to have a better understanding of how certain types of kind of environmental de-identified data um, can be can be considered and in, 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 in protections and sort of attention can be brought there. Um, of course, existing law does provide for that. This was an attempt to try to provide a little more um, assurance there, but that is the that was the intent um, of the term. But we did push that out the waterfront trial. Anyone else? Okay, we can leave it at that. Um, so next on the agenda is the discussion of the DIA, which we understand you're not able to. Um, I, I'm not sure if you were hoping to present or not, but I would. I would actually ask the panel its view as to whether or not it is worth having this overview now, or whether or not we ought to wait until you're actually able to deliver the DIA and then perhaps schedule a, a call so that the time's better spent. Just a question about the delivery of the DIA. So if it had come today, it would have been on Waterfront Toronto's website and it would have been available for public viewing. Correct. If we talk yes. about it on a call, is there a record? I mean, we've, we're trying to work in public as much as possible. So if we have a phone call, how does that work? The DIA is not a deliverable to DSAP. It's, the DIA is a deliverable to Waterfront Toronto. When we receive it, it will be posted to the Keyside site and made available to the public. Right. But if we have a phone call to ask questions about it, it's different than if we talk oh, about it in So I'm just curious, like, do we have an obligation to share our questions the same way we would if we'd received it today? I don't think so. It feels to me like, like there's yeah, maybe a pragmatic can, need to do yeah. it, but I'm just acknowledging that we're trying to work in public all the time, right? Yeah. So, so maybe I'll take this back to the general counsel yeah. to give me better advice on this one. I understand your point. We should try to figure out how we can you know, do as much of this in public, and how do we do that? Um, I have some ideas around that too, in terms of, okay. of technically, technically making that able to happen so everyone doesn't have to travel it, and so on as well. Yeah, yeah. I, it's more just that yeah, we're trying to be on the record. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah no, I totally agree. Uh, and there may be transcriptions that could be provided or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, just yeah. recorded and shared. I was going to say, we may actually yeah. be able to leverage the, the technology if you're doing the briefing to record a Google Meet session for everyone to. So we'll, we can talk about that after, but I think there's a way to do it, Pamela. We're, we're open to whatever decision you want. Yeah. Panel members, do you want to go ahead with this, or would you want to wait for a uh, call to call a briefing to come once there's a document? Is there is there a, a real delta between what you're presenting and the final document? So is there a big change? What, so I mean, the, 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 yeah. what, the, what the slides are is really just a, it's a kind of update to you based on the last presentation we gave. Um, that went through the table of contents. The table of contents has evolved uh, based on the, th the threshold issues, and we just wanted to be able to guide you through um, the structure of the document. It's not actually, we hadn't planned to try in this session to actually literally lead you through every piece of information that is entailed. It was just to provide a, a walkthrough of the structure. Um, so there's not, in that regard, in the slides, you know, information beyond just what the, what the structure of the document is. So, I, I, I don't have any urgency to, to, yeah. to go through the document right now, the presentation. Yeah. Just if, if you're looking for votes, uh, I, I don't have any. Looking for opinions, yeah. Opinions, sir. Right. This question about this, in, in this document, will it at some point in the document get into like an actual sort of block diagram of the architecture? That's one of the things that I've, a few, a few meetings I sort of asked, like, I think the closest we ever got was a box that said API. Uh, <laughs> Um, so is there is there is there a point in this like an appendix to the appendix where we actually get into like this is the system diagram? I mean that to me speaks to I mean I think we've heard a theme around this idea of like digital master planning like yep. since a little while and actually part of what we articulate in the in this document is actually how increasing levels of detail around kind of the digitally enabled services could be provided. Um, like alongside the kind of like what you would normally create as part of the build program for uh, as, as part of like development application. So I think like that's that's like part of what we've started to kind of like articulate and kind of push the forth. Um, also recognizing that there's like, I don't know, Jesse wants to speak to speak to this, but like it, yeah, it's, there's different levels of detail that I think we can expect to kind of. Come maybe you'll, maybe you'll reframe the question in the same way that like. Uh, a master plan would have like a massing stage where you yep. have like a block diagram. This is like park here, condo yep. here, road here. 
will we have at least that level of yes. architectural so, detail? So, 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 so what is provided is uh, there is a list that, 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 that summarizes all of the, the, the details, all the services um, that have been proposed. Yeah, I think we should pull up that slide. Can we pull up that slide? Yes. I was just going to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the slide. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, there's just two, there, there's, there's, there's a list that, that summarizes the, the, the services and, and it goes through and provides information on um, who might a, you know, who might an operator of this might be, what's typical, what is proposed here, helps to get to the questions that have come up a lot here around, you know, is it, you know, in the context of a building distinct from in the context of a street, um, yeah. trying to really reflect that. Um, and then there is also diagrams that um, at a master plan level um, that would be sort of appropriate to this stage of the planning process. Um, describe the types of services and how they relate and embedded in the physical space. Okay. Yeah, so, so this, um, so I can answer questions about what the, the list is, the list which I know this panel has asked for several times is not simply a list with like page index, which it definitely is a list that includes the page index to the, to the main MIDP, but it actually for each digitally enabled service, like links it directly to a Waterfront Toronto priority outcome. Um, it talks about kind of like at a high level, the sorts of data and the sorts of methods of collection. It's kind of like master plan concept level and then like how that data might be processed to kind of like achieve the outcome or the end goal. So it is still kind of like master plan level, but we did try to get really granular. We also talked, did um, pull together whether where there was municipal precedent uh, for any of those digitally enabled services, and like kind of like typical and typical operational oversight of those sorts of systems, and what would be proposed kind of like as part of this project. So it's um, it's a little bit more than just a list. There's actually like substantive um, information about each one. At, I would say the kind of like a master plan sort of level. And um, I think, and, and additionally, I think in terms of. Uh, digital architecture specifically, I think that um, I think it's just important to, to, to state, you know, this project in no way proposes some form of holistic integrated digital layer where there's sort of one application or body that is managing all of that. Um, and to that end, we don't, we've never imagined that um, and we've not put that on the table here. And to that end, we're not actively designing and pursuing some architecture that would be that. So. That I think gets to a lot of the opportunity, in fact, and our desire to see the type of kind of standard setting I think that, that, that you've been alluding to. Um, you know, what we have focused on is is that is what are the outcomes that we think um, we could help better achieve, um, and what are the types of services that are connected to that, and then giving the information of the types of the ways that those work and the precedents. Um, that's the that's the that's the focus here. So maybe just to build on that, what what is missing? Like, I think this whole process has been looking at you guys privately and publicly saying, like, you're going to give us all the answers, but when you give us all the answers, then we're going to, like, barf all over and say, how, <laughs> how dare you, right? So, like, what is missing as an input to you guys? Like, is it is it massing diagram and the standards and, like, the interface between the systems so that you can start to filter the detail in? Because I think there's, like, this awkwardness where we're each looking at each other, waiting for that, maybe, and... Yeah, yeah I think... Um you know, like what, what would be, what would you like to kind of see? I think that like the, I, I don't know if we want to speak well, to kind of this architecture diagram, but well, like we I, will be putting forward some ideas but, as to what this could look but, like. But, but, but I think, I think there's a different, I think that what we would like to see, and I think we've already signaled this through this evolution and the threshold issues is, you know, government setting the rules of the road here, um, Waterfront taking the lead with their partners. Um, you know, defining that digital governance, I think, you know, as it may, you know, obviously all the existing legislation that exists, but I think the, uh, the, the guidelines, uh, as, as has been discussed, I think are a, a kind of promising avenue for establishing uh, a framework of requirements for any actor in this area. Um, so we look forward to those guidelines and that work that's underway, and I think that is a shift from the sort of critique to create mode that, that you were alluding to earlier. And similarly, I think that that standard setting um, that is already underway, that's independent of us, um, that's taking place, whether it's the CIO Strategy Council, Standards Canada, other other folks. You know, last session we heard from Open City Network. I think there's a lot of really important work happening in that space, and as that work evolves, um, you know, and the more specificity that is established there, um, the easier it is for us to fill in um, our work there. We don't see ourselves doing that. Um, and that is, you know, I think 
uh, hopefully become much more clear through this uh, recent resolution on that shift. Um, and we're you know, excited to see the momentum actually that is uh, taking place here, but of certainly in other uh, groups around that. But that, that probably leads to a question of who is doing it with respect to this project. So like it might be done at the Canadian Standards Council and there's work being done with the City Network. But how does that, how will that apply to this project and who does it and how do we do it so that it's there? I don't know if you answer that. Yeah. I mean, I would I mean, come back to Waterfront, but I think that the guidelines are, <clears throat> are, are, are quite a promising and effective vehicle um, yeah. in that they are, form a set of, you know, enforceable, accountable um, requirements for any actor, ourselves or otherwise. And then in that, the CIO Strategy Council is, you know, publishing standards of Canada. Like, those are, those have gone through, like, a very credible, robust process of kind of multi-stakeholder and involves like a lot of different other players. And I think there's, you know, there's reason why those bodies exist and those standards exist is because it actually helps make the, um, helps helps everyone kind of like be able to work together. And I, and I think that we're absolutely excited to see how all of those working groups and the different um, technical standards that are currently being considered in this arena will come out. I think in that sense, we are we are another private sector company that's looking for the same things that are that, that other members of, of organizations like that are looking for. Okay. How big is it? How big is the, the uh, document? Uh, like yeah. is it, yeah. I've heard two hundred. I've heard four hundred. It's four hundred and eighty. Okay. Inches. Less than five hundred pages. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. Cool. Do, 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 to, 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 to be clear, and I think this is you know I think we said this and it's. You know, important to understand. I mean, this this document was very much, you know, you're you're familiar familiar with planning policy justification reports. Um, there was one that was submitted with the MIDP for this project that is hundreds of pages. Master plans, as they are presented, often have expansive technical documents that um, expert audiences review. Um, this is a technical document for a technical audience. It is, and there is a different set of materials that Waterfront is producing for public consultation. Um, so this document is intended for folks like yourself that have the level of technical expertise. It's structured in a way we hope that is it is structured differently than the MIDIP, and it's structured in a way that's responsive to a lot of the feedback you provided around some of the challenges. It doesn't have a separation of physical and digital. It makes a very clear um, holistic integration of that. The tie to procurement and, and policy is all um, interwoven, and so um, it, is, it is designed for that audience, and that's um, why the link um, exists as such. And, and yeah, it's like, you know, like, we were also asked lots of questions about, like, you know, like, how do our practices, like, the RMUA, like, you know, correspond to the PIA, and, like, how, so, like, we go deep in that, like, we actually are going to provide that instrument for, for your kind of, like, inspection and review, um, and, and, and a case study of how that drives some of our kind of technology procurement decisions, um, so, you know, like, it's... You know, like we we restructured, we ended up restructuring the document kind of substantively, like as we work through it, and of course as we work through these, um, you know, threshold issues with waterfront, and you know, as that evolves, so did, you know, I think uh, Michael had a really great Apple Watch analogy that I'm not going to try to repeat from the last meeting, but like we really tried to kind of like come to something that reflected where the project is and doesn't give you a lot of different things to kind of look at, um, and so. You know, there's there's an executive summary. There's section one is really about the combined digital physical program. Section two goes deep into our corporate practices as a company, kind of like aside from the key side. Section three is about ecosystem and kind of like some of the challenges that we've seen, we've researched and heard about in terms of innovation ecosystem and how our activities hope to meet that. And then section four is the kind of like Canadian privacy and policy context as well as kind of like other best you know precedent research from around the world and some of the issues that we're very much grappling with here. So I think um, yeah I mean, we worked pretty hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I think you just gave the presentation. <laughs> well, I did. It was super fast. But I, I mean, like, I think in terms of, but in answering kind of Curtis's, like, first question as to, like, when you would see different elements of, 
you know, exactly how these digitally enabled services would work out, it may be worth talking, because this is about process, it's not just about the thing, like, we need yeah. to show you the thing, but it's about the process. Um, like, you know, I, yeah, this is the City of Toronto development application process, and there's different points at which you provide increasing levels of detail around the built program, and we're committed to providing kind of like a similar corresponding level of detail around the digital architecture, um, like kind of like alongside that. So I think we provide some examples of what that looks like in this appendix, and I think we would be very kind of like excited and like look forward to get kind of like this group's feedback on, 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 what, on kind of like how that, you know, how that feels and does that make sense. I like um, and are recognizing that this is a multi-year process from master plan to implementation, right? Like, you can't get to SKU numbers right now, but. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, well, it looks like we've got a lot of reading ahead. <laughs> you have more time to do that, so. <laughs> I said this to you earlier today, but um, I think you guys have a really hard job, like doing your technology architecture design in the public domain is, uh, I don't think it's ever been done at the scale, at least that I know about. And like, I think, you know, kudos to you guys for sort of having the perseverance to keep putting up with all of our questions and keep answering it. Like, I think it, it feels like we're, there's work to do and we're not there yet, but it feels like this, this could converge at the end of the day. So, um, are on the front lines. I'm sure it's not always fun, but good work. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you. So once we once we do get the plan, then there'll be an effort made to coordinate everybody's schedules to come up with some sort of call, and we'll look into ensuring that that call gets recorded. So that <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. I can. Um, sure, I, I try to talk to this last piece quickly, <laughs> given, that, given that we've touched on it already. Um, so, obviously, the, the next big thing is, is, is the TSAP review or, or the minute or, um, final commentary. Um, I think, as, as Christina mentioned, I think what, what I had have taken away from some of, some of the discussions we'd had in, in the development of the pre previous uh, document was that I think the, the DSAP wanted to have a sense of like you know what's <coughs> what's going to be most helpful to Waterfront Toronto like as as you're producing a document and just uh, looking back or looking at the the process that's kind of I know ahead of me and ahead of ahead of the team in general. Um, <laughs> Good job. I thought that was my number. <laughs> um, I, I, I've tried to kind of, I'm trying to put together a bit of a, a bit of a draft of, of almost like kind of guiding questions or, or, or the, the types of things that, that we're really looking at. Um, as, as was kind of mentioned and, and has been mentioned in, in a, the threshold issues resolution, um, there's this idea of, of kind of like this, this innovation list is being kind of being put together. Um, so I've kind of got four ish areas that I'm kind of thinking about right now. There's, there is this again, list of digitally enabled services that's going to be associated with the meetup. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I'm going to say it. Um, in the, in the, in the list that the, the early drafts that I've seen, there's something like 18, um, 18 initiatives and kind of about 52 sub initiatives associated with that. It's just it's the it's the it's the thing we've been discussing of the bringing together everything that's been discussed across across the room. Um, and so, kind of the, the thing that's good, that's really going to help me in, for, or help us for that, I think, is just having that having this sense of you know which which of these which of these uh, initiatives should be included in a project if it goes forward. So, you know, which, which of them actually do you, does, does the DSAP feel are going to meet Waterfront Toronto uh, objectives that were kind of, you know, set out from, from the beginning of the RFP? Um, you know, are, are there certain things that, that should be 
should only go forward if certain conditions are met. And you know, should can some of those conditions be integrated into the uh, the intelligent community guidelines? Are are they kind of like conditions that are that are environmental or, or specific to a certain a specific uh, technology? Um, and and the the other thing is like you know, if if something isn't necessarily advancing a or doing a lot to advance a specific object or objective, but it's just kind of like an interesting technology. Like, is, is there anything that would be, you would kind of say, okay, that, that could go forward as long as it doesn't actually cost uh, Waterfront Toronto anything. Like, Sidewalk Labs, feel free to experiment. We have no objection with the experiment, but Waterfront Toronto should be paying for it. So that kind of, that kind of and then there's also the category of like, should any of these things just not be included? Um, so that kind of analysis is interesting, as well as like, again, drawing on drawing the, on the experience of the panel to kind of know, um, you know, are there in, in the in the proposals that are that are being made, are there any unstated assumptions that you see in there that are, that are kind of just that, that that might be overlooked and would should factor into Waterfront Toronto's evaluation? Um, <coughs> similar, are, are there just unanswered questions, questions that either you've raised before or things that. You kind of say, you know, I, I can't make that determination without this piece of without this piece of information. Um, and then something I discussed with Kevin slightly earlier, um, the idea of you know helping us to understand, we, we have to evaluate um, the, these these initiatives somewhat against the status quo. So what's what's kind of the delta that this initiative is bringing compared to you know what what a traditional technology or a traditional uh, development would, would bring forward. Um, so, you know, if are, are there, like, um, Pamela was doing, was doing a great job of this in the in the first round, and so was, so was Karen, actually, in the first round of comments of just kind of highlighting, kind of saying, okay, well, this is this is the proposal. Here are some of the things that it should really be compared against, um, just so, so that we kind of have that, that understanding of, you know, we, we don't want to evaluate it in a vacuum. So that's kind of digital enabled services. There's obviously the IP piece of, you know, is, is the revised scheme something that we actually, that, that the DCEP actually feels is, provides an appropriate compensation to the, to the public? Um, and um, given that the, the IP, the, for all, all of these uh, provisions um, are kind of in, intended to be included in a, uh, or intended to apply to all proponents, not just sidewalk labs, um, you know, how, how might we see tiering working? So, you know, is this, is this proposal that's going <laughs> forward, you know, might it have negative impacts on, on a small business, on a small Canadian innovator trying to, uh, trying to come into the, into the neighborhood. So understanding not just the context of, side, of sidewalk labs, but kind of under the, the, the broader context of the innovation ecosystem that we're trying to create. Um, similar, similar uh, the ecosystem development pieces. So um, there's uh, again another table um, that kind of categorizes uh, what the, the specific proposals that the sidewalks bring forward as far as uh, what they see for ecosystem development around investments, procurements, uh, and, their, and their contributions to the to the environment. Again, our, our um, sorry, just want just want to know. It's like. Do, do you think these are go these are going to be effective in meeting the the um, the objective of creating that innovation ecosystem? Um, digital governance is kind of like the last piece. It's it's the interesting piece um, because we have this separate uh, this, this separate piece that's kind of coming forward for for the uh, the uh, intelligent community guidelines. Um, I'm kind of trying to like I'm I'm hoping that we can kind of separate those two. To evaluate evaluated <coughs> pieces out, so um, DSAP is obviously going to have, have a significant ability to feed into the intelligent community guidelines, but those aren't things that are being proposed by Sidewalk Labs. So I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is, like in in, in an evaluation of a DIA, um, I think it's completely reasonable to say, um, you know, you'll you'll have a draft of or a preliminary draft of the intelligent community guidelines. Um, so. Do some of the proposals that are being made by by Sidewalk Labs around uh, responsible AI guidelines, uh, their, their responsible data use assessment and, and guidelines, um, uh, the digital transparency in the public realm projects. Do those? Um, do, do you kind of see those as as beneficial efforts? As kind of like you know, 
good faith signals that um, that that Sidewalk Labs is going to meet its commitments to um, uh, to, to meet the, the intelligent community guidelines once once they're completed. Um, that's that's kind of the lens I'm, I'm hoping to see around digital governance in in this proposal. Again, just because there, there's that there's that. There's that overlap of kind of like sidewalks no longer proposing digital governance um, elements. So in in the review of the DIM, I'm kind of hoping that that could get separated off. Um, and that that's so when, when we're talking about what what I see as being most most helpful for me, those, those are the kind of the, the broad strokes issues. Um, once I get this kind of cleaned up and, and run by some of the some of the folks internally to make sure actually makes sense with what they think the evaluation is going to look like. Um, I, I want to distribute it to the uh, report writing working group or whatever that group becomes. Um, and just for, for, our, for our first meeting, kind of have that discussion of, you know, how, uh, how are we going to tackle this uh, DIA when it comes? That's, um, and I, I, I kind of, like, I, we had floated that, that timeline previously, as we've kind of discussed, that's, Quite in flux now. Um, we're lo we are looking at you know de delivery in, in early February, but I kind of think I, I, I don't want to get into that timeline so much. I, I think that's that's again worth the, the discussion with the with the working group uh, after we get the DIA. And I'm, I'm happy to get feedback on any of that. What, one question that I had was: It sounds like you're saying it would be helpful. And we'd have to figure out, is it two, two completely different documents or two different groups or whatever it is? Is there like, a, you're saying there's a difference between the work to be done uh, on the guidelines or how this applies to the guidelines or how it might impact the guidelines and sidewalk specific uh, proposals. And there's, you're saying that we should sort of separate these two things? Is that, I'm just trying to get it, what I think you're proposing. The guidelines aren't part yeah. of the evaluation, but the evaluation may help inform the next the iteration guideline. of the guidelines. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So this, yeah, the gui the guidelines are the guidelines are part of the um, are part of Waterfront Toronto's um, overall evaluation of, of the, the proposal. Like there, there's a significant digital governance element to the to, the, um, to, to our overall all evaluation. I'm just kind of all trying trying to figure out how again because those are no longer being proposed by Sidewalk Labs. You know, if we're saying this is a review of the proposal that's being put forward by Sidewalk Labs, does it make sense to kind of say, okay, those are going to be handled separately? Right. Yeah. That, that, that was just kind of how I was trying to parse those two things in a little bit. We've already proposed two working groups, right? One, well, one associated with evaluating this and, and another associated with uh, helping the guideline development. I think we already proposed two different we, we did propose a working group for the guideline development. We have not yet uh, decided on how we're doing this. It could be that there's a second. Sure. It, yeah. yeah. It feels like having those guidelines make it easier to review. Yeah. The I, guidelines is going to be hard. I, I mean, Christy, you, you sort of said if we get something in the in, in the meantime, we'll <coughs> use these as interim guidelines. Well, I think we're getting something next week that we can use these as interim guidelines. That's correct. So, so I mean, which, which is the, this digital appendix. So I, I, I can't see how we would avoid using the interim guidelines to help evaluate this proposal. Yeah. The, the one thing I would caution is that the guidelines are very technical and implementation oriented. So you might lose the forest through the trees. So some of the things that Sidewalk is proposing are much larger concepts and higher level. Yeah. So it's going to be very hard to map the guidelines at this point in time to what they're suggesting based on where they are in that that's, process. That's so just, fair. So, just so, a caution. So yeah, so I mean, it's fair to say that, that they may be an input, but they're not, they should not be the only, yeah. the only right. input to the evaluation. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I accept that. So. Also had a question around timelines. So, George, I think you had mentioned in your presentation that in January there's a milestone where there's some back and forth with there's going to be something that it might be this innovation plan that sidewalk is delivering they'll be back and forth and then there'll be a further delivery later and if i'm if i heard or that correctly, sorry 
or along the way because we'll be or along the way yeah okay and so i'm just trying to figure out what's the we've got we've got a set of guidelines that we're participating in the formulation of that is a bit of a moving that that will be changing as we go along and then we've got an innovation plan and other associated documents dia and everything that that are also a moving sort of that are that's mutable <laughs> and so i guess we have to figure out what's the bet like how are we actually evaluating two things that are constantly changing so we'll, we'll provide some very specific guidance, as I said, about what is the scope of the evaluation. It's predominantly the DIA, which the sidewalk has taken the extra time now to map to the threshold issue. So the DIA should accurately reflect the scope of the project. Um, and then we would notify this group if there's anything that fundamentally has changed from the DIA submission as a result of the work that's been ongoing for the innovation plan. And you would have visibility on the guidelines as they evolve. But again, the guidelines are meant in I don't know, Greg, there was the earlier thing. The guidelines actually are to inform implementation, right? So what, we shouldn't put the cart before the horse in terms of what is meant for what purpose. There is an evaluation framework that was developed in concert with KPMG that will guide Waterfront Toronto's formal evaluation of this process. The report slash, if you want to call it final commentary from DSAP, if you will, helps to inform that evaluation. So there are separate pieces that evolve into this, this component. So we only fact that the, the innovation plan would play on this is if something specific has come off the table that you should no longer have to concern yourselves with evaluating or if the scope has changed on something. But your fundamental document will be the DIA and that's why we afforded them the extra time to adjust the DIA. <laughs> if, I, if I can just clarify, so a lot of the scoping down has occurred. I haven't seen the document yet, but it's already occurred. Um, and we will be dialoguing to resolve as many issues in terms of scope uh, early and not, you know, way before January. So hopefully you'll get guidance from us. Okay. Losing it a few bit, but that, this actually provides a bit of a segue into the very last thing on our agenda in the last 10 minutes, which has to do with the refresh of the DSAP working groups. Uh, we've had already, already some discussion on this already. I, I suppose it's worth opening opening up both to whether or not, what, what are the core groups that we want to focus on? And obviously these two plus the governance one where there are issues coming up. Um, and are there people that want to, that may not have previously been members of one of these working groups that now would like to find themselves on it or have been on it and would like to uh, escape? Kind of like the Hotel California here for working groups. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, you can join it. I mean, we don't we don't necessarily have to decide specifically on composition this moment. Um, I think can give it a little bit of thought as long as we know that we've got people who are willing to make the commitment. I guess more fundamentally, is this the right approach with the working groups that we've got, or uh, given the timelines of the work, should should we be entertaining some other sort of possibility? Say some initial thoughts. Um, I was part of the report writing committee and personally until I'm able to see the document and the technical expertise kind of required to really understand it fully, I'm not really comfortable yes. either way committing my time. So I, I think that's where I struggle with that. That's fair. But maybe the question, as you said, the question before we decide who's on what is what, what the what is. So should we have the two groups? Should it all be one group? I, I think the two groups make sense because they're very different things. Yes, that, I agree. Very different reasons that we're looking at. And it was also just for yeah. clarifying scope creep and, and yeah. scope bleed. Yeah. It's also technical expertise, though, right? I mean, we run into a scenario where a lot of our kind of heavy duty technical expertise are on the guidelines, and a lot of our brain power is there. And because of that, we don't have that kind of strength on the report writing committee. So some of those considerations should be. So maybe what we can do is we will post the current composition onto the, the Google Drive and you guys can self-elect it once you see the document of where to move things. I, I would suggest though that some of the core folks that are, and I'm looking right at you, on the Architecture and Standards Committee not opt to get off the Architecture and Standards Committee. Um, and then also just Pamela for visibility and Michael. I mean, there is a role for the government Governance Committee that I think needs to be looked at as well in the next little bit because renewals and refreshes are coming up and I think we need to spend some time looking at skill set 
of what will be required as we move into an implementation phase. So I think those three committees being very active in the next little bit is a, a realistic uh, potential that we need to be ready for. I would know, I, I thought there were great brains on the report uh, drafting committee last time. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure there would be again these great brains on this panel more broadly. I, I do think that it, it's important to emphasize, though, for all panel members that um, the working groups obviously do a, do some pretty heavy, heavy lifting. But the notion that uh, the remaining panel members just sit back and wait for something, I don't think is going to work in this context. Yes. Uh, there are people that have some significant expertise in different areas, and that you know even. Even if we do are going to apportion ourselves in this working group structure yet again as a mechanism to just kind of ensure that there's some momentum, it's really incumbent on everyone to ensure that they they provide input in their areas of expertise to both of the working groups, both on the guidelines and on the DIA. It's, uh, and, and maybe otherwise, this doesn't work. And to amplify that point, I mean, the report writing group was whatever success it had was built on the very detailed comments that came from panelists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and without that, there wouldn't have been anything of substance that we on our own would have created. So uh, absolutely, it's, um, it, it's just a matter of committing to meetings and time and all of that kind of stuff as opposed to being able to on your own. So I would rely on commenting uh, from individual panelists regardless. Uh, we have to. Yeah, and we even, I mean, it's incumbent on the working groups too, because I think we reached out to, there's some sections where yeah. we really need this panelist's opinion yeah. on that. Yeah. You know, and, so and that worked very positively. Yeah. 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 And, and I just wanted to make a public comment, Karen, that your, your public sector perspective, regardless of how you feel about your technical expertise, I think is very valuable. Because, you, I mean, really, you, you, you live in that world, and, and so you have a particular view that a private sector guy like me wouldn't necessarily have. So We often have those conversations in the conference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, so it sounds like in the next, hopefully, week or so, we'll actually we'll get the DIA, and we can use that as the uh, spark plug to both have, a, have an opportunity to schedule a, a call that we've talked about, uh, and then also use that as the opportunity to populate uh, these couple of groups, but also with understanding that uh, active involvement from as many panelists as possible in your area of expertise is absolutely critical to ensuring that we get a comparably excellent work product coming out of this as similar to what we had in the last one. There's one other, uh, I think it was noted earlier, uh, it was suggested that there be a joint meeting of the design review panel and the DSAP. So I think we, we don't want to lose that and that be around process. I think also uh, I, I was invited, I was asked by Waterfront Toronto to present our commentary to the Keyside Stakeholders Advisory, advisory Group. Yeah. Um, and I think we'd had some conversation around should there be any connections between the constellation of advisory groups that Waterfront Toronto has on this project. I don't know if the answer is yes, but I think it is. it was worthwhile for me to hear the conversation that this, the other states, the colors, the community groups had around the project. I think it helped my thinking on it. So uh, there might be some further connections around uh, between the, the groups that we might, might want to build. I think Waterfront for All is having their annual general meeting very soon, and we could get you the date if anybody was interested in having that. Or if you know the date offhand. I don't know it offhand. I can send. We can send you the date if anybody's interested. That might be uh, for sure. Meeting to attend. Okay. Uh, I assume that kind of informs the constitution of this board as we were this advisory panel as well, right? Because I'm sensing there's a need to go beyond what we have from constituents in order to bring you know, various aspects to the table simply by the fact that digital does <coughs> emanate across every aspect. So maybe those other aspects need to have a voice at the table, much like Karen brings sort of the aspect around the public side. And you know, with the accessibility side of it and so on. Yeah. 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 Uh, the other one question I have is there's still the option to have the DIA and sent to us in a hard copy form as opposed to... Yes, absolutely. Digital. Please sign me up for that. Actually, one of the things Vance will get in touch with you tomorrow is just um, with regards to giving us permission to share your address with Sidewalk. 
so they can actually courier you a copy directly just to save the shipping time of coming here and then going there and so on. Just to save us some time. Let's make some already have our interest. We're just giving consent. <laughs> <laughs> About the, um, the evaluation, um, I believe it's important that we have the ability for some background research um, uh, into issues that um, consider important um, and that we won't have time ourselves to uh, dig into. Uh, one of them you mentioned is uh, local stakeholders, and perhaps that's done through meetings, but um, another is, is uh, looking at comparison to other smart city initiatives, because um, there are a number of them around the world um, that are, are relevant. Um, comparison of, uh, maybe this is more on the, uh, on the guidelines, but uh, looking at digital governance models that have been tried elsewhere. Perhaps that's already been done. I'm not trying to look for new work. Um, also looking at the um, assessing the public consultation uh, results um, in relation to what is being proposed in the DIA. Um, this is, I think there's some issues there. So so is there, is there a possibility of resources for that? Um, is there time? So, so here's what I'm going to suggest. If um, through your chair, there are certain items that you think would be helpful, um, Michael can reach out to me and I'll see what I can do and we can prioritize and see what we can do to support that. And, and we will also surface the materials that we've done in terms of background materials around things helpful. like Barcelona, yep. Amsterdam, Estonia, and so on, and be able to actually share that just as a resource. I think it's actually in the Google Drive somewhere but that has grown a bit organically so we'll just make sure that that's surfaced and brought forward for yeah if again. we can yeah. if we can help them triage absolutely we'll put together a package of relevant materials that are fresh and in front of you uh, for the review and then also with regards to the public consultation piece uh, we did share the full report we have all the raw data as well so we should be able to do a bit of a, a cross tab look at, at what actually has been proposed versus what some of the concerns were raised as well yeah all right okay um as soon as no other business at this stage, and uh, um, unless there is. No, just actually the city has Michael Noble left. Oh, yeah, he had to go. He had to go? Okay. Um, so I will say that the city will likely be reaching oh. out to some oh. members. Somebody's back there. We are here. Oh. Are you, Alice? Yes. Just with regards to the DSAP connection to the city yeah. process. You can go ahead, Christina. No, go ahead. Oh, I didn't know you were still here. Yeah. We are here. Um, I just wanted <laughs> to uh, introduce myself. I'm Alice. So I'm the manager for the Smart City Connect Community Group. Uh, at the City of Toronto, wanted to, um, to let you know that we will be reaching out um, in the near future. Uh, we're really impressed by the expertise and the passion in this group, and it's been a really eye-opening um, you know, conversation again today. So uh, there are so many similarities about the public good that we're trying to uh, achieve through uh, the work that we're doing, as well as the work that you're doing. So um, our public consultations, as um, Carol mentioned earlier, will be in uh, December. Um, but we have our um, other channels open now to receive public feedback. So, thank you so much. Thanks, Alice. Uh, in that case, can I get a motion to adjourn? <laughs> All the hands went up so quick. Yeah. 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 Right on right after we're tired. Well, I'm on the nose. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.